Third and four. Sanders fires. Tipped up. Picked off by the Dylan Doyle. And Doyle with another Baylor interception. That's the third one of the night. Welcome to Sikkim 365 Radio. Room four. Big seam. Jerome Ford is revving and tearing it up. Touchdown Cincinnati. 79 yards. Sikkim 365 Radio is presented by idealmri.com high quality mris for 497 dollars or less idealmri.com your health is important so is your budget they go to the eye the action bohannon back in the end zone and a touchdown for baylor great dabney's second catch of the drive and it's good for six the 3 o'clock hour is sponsored by Waco Custom Marketplace. Meats, sweets, Texas treats, and a cut above the rest. 425 Lake Air Drive, Waco. The extra men on the rush. Prescott airs it out. Lamb, got it. Touchdown, Cowboys. Now here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. Oh, good afternoon on this Friday. Beautiful, beautiful day in uh, Central Texas. And hopefully, wherever you are from coast to coast on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports, we're going to introduce one of our guests that does an incredible job of breaking down analytics and stats and trends and much more. You know him as Dr. Evan Miyakawa. Today, he walked the stage and received his doctorate degree. We're going to have him in studio. And he has family here, mom and dad, grandparents, and also step, uh, 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 father-in-law is here as well. Mr. Thompson is in the uh, studio uh, as well. Paul Catalina, Craig Smoke, also Jack McKenzie runs the mothership. And Emery Winter is also behind the scenes as well. I would like to get into something when it comes to the transfer portal, which we discuss college football and athletics quite a bit. There's an article today in uh, ESPN.com, and we're going to drop in with some of the schools that are mentioned or not. The ones that I want to start with, the teams that lost the most value, obviously the star power of Caleb Williams, among some other things that Oklahoma lost, and they also gained some as well. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, so we have two Big 12 teams right off the top. Virginia is also on this list. West Virginia, another Big 12 team, and Auburn. Well, Auburn Auburn obviously has the issues of uh, what's going on with Brian Harson and the head coach? West Virginia, this is the second year in a row they've lost a bunch of people to the transfer portal. Now they added back JT Daniels and I'm sure a couple other guys, but uh, they're, they're one of those teams that, that is going to have to take advantage of the new rule, not capping scholarships on the signing class because they've lost so many people over the last couple of years. Welcome to us also in the chat room. You can call us at 254-339-1122. That's also open along with the text line as well. Mick Muffin opens up the day uh, on the chat room and says hi to Scotty the Baylor King. Scotty B there, by the way. Baylor men's tennis in the round of 16. Sweet 16 tonight at home against Stanford. They're 18-3 and all-time against the Stanford men in the NCAA tournament and also elsewhere. They will play tonight over at the Herd Tennis Center. That is on tonight as well. Derwake is there. Paula is there. Alex Brown is there. Hey, guys, don't forget Kansas State is the dark horse team for the Big 12. Joey, the West Virginia fan, also on the chat room. And Lee Buttercup, happy Friday from Lee. And Pat 08 Mullins, Memphis and Boise. No one else stay at 14. They need to add those teams when Texas and Oklahoma leave. We have discussed those teams. Yeah, we have. Um, yeah, I mean, that's an opinion. I mean, I, I don't really know what the what, where to go with that. But, yeah, thanks for the input. Um, and uh, on the Kansas State thing, I don't know exactly what that's referring to. I'm not reading the chat, so you're going to have to help me out as far as, you know, what I people are talking about. But Kansas State dark horse team for the Big 12. Just a comment from Alex, a fan of K-State. I, okay. I, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I'm not buying that right now. Um, but okay. Uh, yeah, I would say they're right in the middle of the pack, and um, you know, depending on how they finish out the rest of this roster, uh, you know, certainly they could be a dark horse. Um, uh, 
you know, they uh, they did add Adrian Martinez. That'll be interesting to see kind of how that goes. They've got Deuce Vaughn. I mean, yeah, they're a team that's in line to, to be better. That's for sure. I don't know about a dark horse, but I guess since they are expected to be better and they're not expected to be at the top, then, yeah, that would qualify as a dark horse. Well, Baylor would have been qualified as a, a long shot dark horse, and they won the Big 12 going 12-2. and two. So maybe there's someone like that this year from a name that's not a part of what you see right now when you look at the odds or whoever thinks, of course, with – with Baylor, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, and of course there's a lot of smoke as always about the uh, hype and uh, what Texas has as far as weapons as well. Uh, from uh, Pat, by the way, Neil Brown needs to win seven, maybe eight games as West Virginia fans are talking about what they need to do, and that's going to be hard. That's going to be tough for him to get to I, that number. I have not heard one single West Virginia fan bullish on Neil Brown. And we have Jed Drenning on the show today. We can ask him about that's why we what have the, the, on, temp yeah. the temperature of – of how he feels about the fan base. Well, we have, Chad, we're going to check in with Florida today, USC today. Jordan Addison's out in uh, uh, L.A. visiting USC. He was at Texas this week. They took pictures. He did the whole full meal deal like you see a lot of different players when they're being recruited. Also today, we're going to check in with LSU with Mike Scarborough as well. And, of course, again, Dr. Evan Miyakawa will join us here momentarily uh, as well. Now, on the transfer portal, those are the teams that apparently lost the most. Here are the teams they say won the most. Starting out, and I don't know if this is any particular order, but Alabama. So the rich get richer. We, and, and, I, and you almost sometimes forget Alabama, not forget Alabama as a football team and a power and a team that's run really college football, along with a couple of others that have come in, gone, been a part of it, Clemson, Georgia, et cetera. Alabama. Ole Miss, LSU, USC, and UCLA pops in as one of those that's gained quite a bit when it comes to, as well, the transfer portal. I kind of believe it when I see it with UCLA. Uh, you know, it's not surprising that Oklahoma is a team that lost value, and the most value they lost, the team that gained that was the team that, that got Caleb Williams in, in USC, where everybody knew he was going the whole time. But uh, USC has loaded up uh, other transfers as well. But let's just see if they can put it all together. For Alabama, they just sit there and wait for the best four or five guys to go in the transfer portal and say, would you like to come here? And then that's kind of what happens. With How them. much, Craig, do you think just Caleb Williams alone puts USC in that list? I mean, I guess it must – I don't know. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me. So, what, are they ranked like the number one team the or one, something? Among the top five teams most benefited from the transfer portal to this point. I mean, he gives them a little bit of a boost, but uh, they've added a lot of other guys too. I mean, it's not just him. Um, you know, if it was just him, I don't think that they're at the top of that list. But the fact that it's him and several other players that they brought in, uh, you know, boosts them quite a bit. But, uh, no, he's a good get. USC should be a lot better this year. Uh, Lincoln Riley's got some momentum out there, and, uh, you know, they're going to keep grabbing five stars. I mean, you look at their recruiting classes that are already building up. You look at what they've added in the transfer portal, and, um, you know, they're going to be on a lot of these types of lists, I think, moving forward. And I don't know that I'm ready to start talking about them and, you know, the playoff and all of that just yet. Right. But, uh, I, you know, I don't think it's going to be a long journey for them to get there, quite frankly. The Pac-12 is not intimidating in any way, really, outside of Utah and Oregon. So if you can, you know, at least go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them early on, then – keep recruiting the way that you are um, they're going to be you know the class of that conference and right there with those other two teams and pretty much no time in my opinion I don't know if it's going to be this year but I don't think it's going to take very long well one of the things that we do know of is that uh, it's not over because Jordan Addison still has to make his decision the Bolitnikoff award winner the wide receiver from Pittsburgh one of the stats that they have in this list and I never thought of it this way as far as how many career snaps a team or a program has gained in the transfer portal all right, USC just over 10,600 snaps. That, and how much has Caleb Williams played? Not much. So that's my point yeah. is that they've added a ton, and it's not just Caleb Williams, and that's why they're at the top of this list because he's played one year, and they've got 10,000-plus snaps. Yep. So what, like 1,000 are coming from him? So where are the other 9,000 snaps coming from? All the other guys that they got, which is why they're at the top of that list again. Makai Blackman, a Colorado uh, a player, defensive back, is one of the others that they added as well. UCLA, 10,250. Listen to this number here. Ole Miss, 9,966. Alabama, just over 5,000 snaps. But the names they got, Eli Ricks from LSU, 
Uh, J- Jameer uh, Gibbs from Georgia Tech, who had an explosive spring game. Jermaine Burton, the transfer receiver from Georgia. And, and obviously, there's still the possibility there's even some smoke. Maybe that's where Addison ends up. Who knows? But LSU with Brian Kelly, 15,129 snaps. Now, I don't know how many of those snaps are quality, but that's a ton of experience that they've had to bring, including Oklahoma State uh, uh, Jarek uh, Bernard Converse, who was like the top two or three cornerback in the Big 12 a year ago. Well, and that's what uh, he kind of was going to need if they were going to be successful this year because LSU's roster was cleaned out. Uh, people jumping into the transfer portal that were NO guys or maybe even Dave Aranda guys for to some extent, but you know people who were there for the, the other coaching staff, people he didn't want back, uh, and... Yeah, he was going to have to build it that, that way, or that's what he set out to do. So, yeah, he's got a lot of experienced players. But, again, it's how it all meshes together. You know, does it, does it happen in one year? That's it's, LSU and USC are kind of, kind of in similar boats in that, yeah, there's probably a lot of experienced and talented guys that add that, but you know, does it gel together to win the conference or push forward in year one? That's a lot to ask even the best coaches to do because you, you, you got to, you know, when Lincoln Riley took over at, at Oklahoma, for example, I mean, he was – he was stepping into something that was already built. Yep. I mean, he kind of just you know took over driving the car. It's like, like like Ryan Day at Ohio State. Yeah, it was already there, so they could hit the ground running. As were USC and 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 LSU is probably and LSU is a almost near total rebuild two years after a national championship because the roster that was there is gone and gutted and transfer portaled and NFL out. One of the number one topics right now in the chat room is about. The Big 12 in the future, because of remember earlier this week, Baylor's Mac Rhodes, the athletic director, pretty much confirming a report from last week. They met last week in Scottsdale in Phoenix, Arizona, the Big 12, but also college conferences, coaches, ADs, et cetera, everywhere that Cincinnati, Houston, and also UCF will be joining the conference as early as next summer, which was not the original plan. It was 24 for them. Brigham Young's coming in during the summer of next year, no matter what. Uh, and and there now a lot are starting to say, okay, who's next? Can we get to the start finish line first and let uh, those fourteen teams kind of settle in before you start? And, and hey, we have brought up the expansion phase two, but a lot of arguments about who should be the next two or four teams. And I love it because that means you have passion for the program you're fighting for. If they don't add value, don't add them. So, you know, that's that's where I sit on it. You know, I'm all for the fun and the changes. And uh, that's what it is, is most people just get excited about change. That's just, you know, people get lit up by change. Just, oh, something new, something shiny, something fresh, something different. And, you know, certainly conference realignment has provided that. And we got months of that. And then it's settled down and it's been settled down. And now it's picking back up again because you've got, you know, the movement as far as the schools that were moving last year now officially – you know, laying out their plans, but I don't think the Big 12 is apt to just turn around in the next couple of weeks and go like, yep, we're adding a couple more. I think, uh, you know, there's TV deals to be sorted out um, in the next couple of years. There's a lot to be sorted out in the next couple of years. So, you know, if a Memphis can bring value and everybody's making as much, if not more money with them a part of a conference, then bring it on. If they're joining the conference and the Big 12, who's already going to be at best third in revenue, and that's going to be a third that's like, miles and miles and one, miles one and, and then the basically three and miles behind number two then um yeah that's uh not really going to do a whole lot if you're just coming in and you're sinking the value even further so you know that's where i stand on it i have nothing against any school you know being added other than just it's it's got to make sense and if you're added and you bring the value down per school then it doesn't make sense to me it just makes no sense now if you can show where the TV ratings go up or something that eventually leads to more revenue, maybe not initially, but, you know, five years down the road, all of a sudden, like, boom, Memphis and, you know, uh, whoever else you want to throw into that mix, they bring these markets and the Big 12 gets a little bit more for that. Okay, great. But if not, if it's just this, if there's no jolt, then there's no point. I mean, there's just not a point to do that. No, you don't add to add. You have to. And, and Stephen, uh, by the way, makes a good point on the chat room. Um, they might add who whatever network is going to carry their games and whatever grant of rights is next, whatever contract they have with the conference, they might add two teams if that's what that t- well, particular I, network I, wants them to I, do. I, I was going to bring that up. I, yeah. I think I think that's probably 
the the toe in the water. We'll find out a lot about uh, how the Big 12 feels about conference expansion in general after the TV deal. If they say, no, we're good where we're at at 12, because that to me would lead them to think it's like, okay, so we have 12 teams right now and these are the 12 teams, but what if we were to add four more teams and be 16? And what if these are the four teams? And if the television partners go, meh, then maybe you don't do it. No, you're right. You're right. Uh, uh, one other note about the and I don't know. Portal. I mean, are there, are there four teams? I yeah. I say maybe two. Yeah. I mean, maybe Memphis and whoever else you want to throw in State, Boise yeah. State. But I think you're starting to stretch it big time after that. I mean, I, I know San Diego State fan will pop in and say you know location and facilities and all that, and I know UNLV fan will pop in and say Vegas is thriving and blowing up. But wouldn't mind going there. Yeah, you wouldn't mind going there, but again, does it bring value ultimately? No. So that's what they've got to figure out. And it's again, I'm not being anti those schools or those places, but you know, also, I mean, do you want to cover the entire country? Do you want to be that far spread out? You know, do you need to do that so that you do have pockets that are closer together so that BYU has some company out west? There's a lot of factors to, to consider. So, um, yeah, I mean, if it makes sense, add them. But if it if there's you know less money going around and there's harder travel and there's you know, less uh, less food on the table than it, you know. It's gotta it's gotta make sense. And and right now, we don't know what the TV numbers are gonna look like or what TV networks think. So yeah, if they come through and they say adding two more would shoot your value up another ten million dollars, then boom, bring on San Diego State and UNLV or Boise State or whoever. But um, you know, we don't know. We don't know, and, and we won't know until we see some of these other TV contracts start to get underway a little bit. Back to the transfer portal, top five, and, and also the five that lost the most. This is from UC Fast in the chat room, and then Dr. Evan Miyakawa will join us uh, in studio today with his family as well. Did you guys know that UCF transferred in the top passing, pass-catching tight end from Florida, the top receiver from Auburn, and a quarterback from Ole Miss that had over a thousand yards rushing as a true freshman? So he was throwing that in there as well with what UCF has brought to the table with uh, Gus Malzahn as their head coach. Yeah, they also lost Jalen Robinson, although I know they didn't really have him playing a whole lot last year. So I'm, I'm very interested to see UCF. They don't have a whole lot of buzz right now. Um, you know, last year was just kind of so-so. But they got Gus Malzahn, who is proven to be a you know great head coach. So I have uh, confidence that he will get them going in a, in a good direction. But, uh, yeah, it would be nice to see them jump up and make a little noise this season. And one way to do that is through the transfer portal. So uh, I could definitely see them being a team that benefits from that. From one other chat room comment, we're not adding anybody or should not anybody, this is a Big 12, without a budget of uh, that has a budget under $70 million, an athletic budget under $70 million, and ever have less than 40,000 fans in a home attendance. That's another comment about expansion. Yeah. Uh, and, and then UCF, by the way, don't forget they lost Dylan Gabriel, yeah. uh, their quarterback yeah. who transferred out as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's an obvious one. I just I don't go immediately to him as like a major major loss because he's been so hurt all the time. Like they've kind of you know gotten used to to playing without him to some extent. But yeah, I mean, he's also another um, you know big loss um, in terms of what he did at UCF. And I'll, I'm really curious to see how he does at Oklahoma. I mean, you're following. A pretty good stretch of quarterbacks, <laughs> you know, multiple Heisman winners, and now like the most prolific transfer that we've seen, you know, in this little portal era, or one of them, and Caleb Williams. Uh, but but yeah, it's going to be really uh, interesting to see Dylan Gabriel with Jeff Lebby and and you know knowing what they did at UCF together and knowing how that Bryles offense goes. Um, you know, they could be. They could be pretty good, and they could be a sleeper team, quite frankly. And I know they won't be considered a sleeper team because they're Oklahoma, and, and Dolts will just you know fill them in at number one just because that's what they're so used to. Uh, but I don't know. I Dolts. think there's yeah. I think there's just as good of a chance that they are above average uh, to surprisingly good. Yeah. I really don't know. Who knows? They could be eight and five. They could be eleven and two. Who knows? But they are Oklahoma along. And again, be careful with the logo. We've learned that from others as well. But they have, despite last year, they almost. What was it, like a last-second something when Caleb Williams almost brought them back? They would have been playing again against Oklahoma State for the Big 12 title and not Baylor. All right, when we come back, today we're dropping in with the following programs. West Virginia, Florida, USC, and also LSU. We're going to check in with them, the transfer portal, wins and losses, additions, subtractions, whatever, and just where they are as they hit the summer with a lot of schools ending their semester. And speaking of which... That is Dr. Evan Miyakawa, and he's next on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports.
I, I'm not sure what you're going to have today on the grill, but you have an opportunity if you want to go get a great looking steak or what you want when it comes to maybe Norwegian salmon. And if you want even sausage or well, possibly chicken, seafood, pork, poultry, and beef in the bakery and also butcher shop at Waco Custom Marketplace at 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco. It's too late for it now, but remember, anytime up until 6 o'clock Wednesday, you can go and order 30-pound sacks of live crawfish. Crawfish boils are going on all over the place right now. 30-pound sacks of live crawfish for under $4, and that price will fluctuate from one week to the next. Order by Wednesday at 6. Pick it up anytime after 4 o'clock on Friday or when they're open on Saturday as well. A full throttle bakery, butcher shop, great people. Hometown grocery store atmosphere. The Bauer family does a great job. Waco Custom Marketplace at 425 Lake Air Drive in Waco. Payments for qualified buyers at 2.9% for 72 months with $5,000 down cash or trade. TTL Extra. See dealer for details. Summer driving is coming. Save now at Richard Carr's Summer is Coming Savings Event. Find summer savings like a 2015 GMC Sierra 2500 HD for $318 a month. Our 2020 Buick Encore for $288 a month. Or get a 2015 Cadillac SRX for $212 a month. Our vehicles go through a 172-point inspection, and we pay top dollar for your trade. 100% approval is always our goal. At Richard Carr, we give you. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be a part of the Waco community. We're a small family business right here in Central Texas, and our goal is to bring down the cost of health care while maintaining high quality. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important, and unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. That's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through the difficult time. We offer premium MRIs just like a hospital with state-of-the-art technology and specialists, but you'll pay less. Sometimes thousands of dollars less, whether you're using insurance or not. At Ideal MRI, we accept most insurance and there are no hidden costs. Even offering financing if that's needed, everything included in the price, and you'll not get something as a surprise in the mail later on. If you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. They'll know. You can schedule an appointment safely from home online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or give us a call, 833-IDEAL-MRI, Ideal MRI. MRI.com. In the market for a quality metal building? Since 1943, Pioneer Steel and Pipe has helped Central Texas residential and commercial customers with metal building design, panel options, building components, and trim options. Pioneer Steel and Pipe's residential line is energy efficient, offers low maintenance, reduces insurance payments, is impact resistant, and carries up to a 45-year limited warranty. In addition, they can also help you find a metal building contractor for your project. Pioneer Steel and Pipe with locations in Waco and Bryan and at PioneerBoys.com. In Texas, there's pea-sized hail and baseball-sized hail. Guess which one hit our house? We didn't even know where to begin, but we called our Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent, and he was so reassuring. He knew exactly what to do to get our house back into shape and our lives back to normal. Now, we're even more thankful for the roof over our heads. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Did you know that Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness is a partner of the city of Waco? Did you know that we are open to the public? Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness offers day passes to the public for only $10 a day, and we offer money-saving memberships. Waco Regional Tennis and Fitness offers over 40 group exercise classes each week, including bar, yoga, boot camp, indoor cycling, and more. There are free weights, weight machines, TRX, rowing machines, stationary bikes, new treadmills, elliptical machines, and much more in the spacious weight room floor. Personal training available where you can be encouraged to grow. Sauna, Whirlpool. Tanning Bed and Kids Club, 17 tennis courts, 8 pickleball courts, youth and adult tennis and pickleball lessons. Waco's premier experience where you can help your mind, body, and soul. Visit our website at wacotennis.com. Call us at 254-753-7675 or visit us next to Hawaiian Falls on Lakeshore Drive in Waco.
One size fits all. That may be all right for an adjustable belt or cheap sunglasses, but when it comes to your financial needs, no one wants a one size fits all strategy. Cam Heathcott, your Edward Jones financial advisor, knows that his most important goals are yours. That's why he takes the time to understand your needs, knowing you. That's how Edward Jones makes sense of investing. Cam Heathcott, covering Conroe and Houston, 936 756 7717 or cam.heathcott at edwardjones.com. Edward Jones, member SI. PC. This is Sikkim 365 Radio. Text us at 254-339-1122. The Sikkim 365 Radio text line is sponsored by Riverbend Liquor and Wine with the most extensive variety of craft beer in Waco. A hidden gem on Lakeshore Drive and 19th Street. By the way, one of our viewers, Steve Snook out of Ohio, sent me a couple of things of what he thought about pods and how you could break down pods and what happens if the Big 12 was to add, let's say some other conference struggles with their grant of rights or their renewal, and maybe what happens if teams are added. We're going to have those graphics. Jack put those together for you today uh, as well. We're now joined in studio by Dr. Evan Miyakawa. Uh, He is the one, you know who he is. He's the one that's helped break down so many different things when it comes to trends, stats, and analytics. And tell us what happened today with you. Uh, this was an anticipated day for a long time. I finally got to walk uh, for my, my PhD in statistics at Baylor. Um, I haven't been back in Waco since 2020, so I've still been working on my dissertation remotely. I defended my dissertation back in January, but this is my first time back here since 2020, so it's been great to be back. Uh, to be so, in the Farrell Center and all that good stuff. So it's been a good day so far. So you defended your dissertation like over Zoom? Yes, that's correct, which was not the norm until COVID for sure. Yeah. So pre-COVID, you would have stayed here in Waco. You would have defended in person. But because I've been living in Indiana for the last couple of years, they were okay with me doing it you know, over, over video. So that worked out pretty nicely. How's Waco looking compared to two years ago when you were here? Um, it, uh, you know, a lot has changed and a lot's the same, you know. So it's, uh, I've only been here for, you know, 12 hours or something, but, um, <laughs> oh, drive around still going, yeah. you know, I can always count on that. So drive around the block and see yeah. all the construction. I mean, it's ridiculous yeah. right now. Like every single road in this town's under I, construction, basically. I, I believe so. Every, you look one way or the other, whether it's not just I-35, it's every, it, and that means there's a lot of money being spent. The entire a lot of downtown is under construction right yeah. now. Yeah. It's so. nuts. So for those who don't know, or for those like me who never were even thought of, of going to get my doctorate, when you say defend your dissertation, explain that for maybe somebody that doesn't know like me or others. Sure. So to, in order to get your PhD, you have a certain number of credits that you have to get just like an undergrad. And so I took about three years to finish all of my coursework. But then on top of that, I started doing some research with uh, an advisor or two in my statistics department at Baylor and you basically put together a multiple chapters that form a thesis uh, that's your your phd dissertation and then when you're done with all of that you basically have a presentation where you defend your dissertation and basically present on some of your work that you've done and then some committee members and audience members can challenge you with questions and stuff and then they send you to your own private room which in my case was just um, booting me off the Zoom call for a few minutes, and they deliberate, and then they tell you whether you passed or failed. So, <laughs> is that is that an anxiety? Is that high anxiety? Even if you know you aced whatever you had to do, I do think so. I think uh, I knew that I was going to be fine. They don't really put you in a position to defend if they don't think you're going to do well, but you still don't really feel 100% confident until they they tell you that you're officially uh you know have your doctorate. So, yeah. I think the worst thing would be like we don't do this often, but. Uh, you were about 75% in, and you need to do a little bit more work. So we'll do this again in six months. You know? I've heard some horror stories. Yeah. I've heard some horror stories of people who have passed, but then also told that they had to correct something, and it's taken them a year or year and a half to finish after that. So thankfully, everything was fine with mine. You have some family in studio, five guests that are in studio, mom, dad, grandparents, grandmother and grandfather, and also your your father-in-law, you want to just, I, we don't have a camera on all of them. There's an overview, but I don't think we can get all of them. But you want to introduce everybody that's here? Yeah, so my my mom and dad are over here. My grandparents who live in Alabama. My father-in-law, Keith, is here. My wife is also in town, but she's not able to be here right now. Um, but I'm just glad they're here. Mm -hmm. uh, when I graduated with my master's from Baylor back in 2018, I actually forgot to tell my parents that I was walking. 
um, because I didn't think it was that big of a deal, and I thought I had told them and I hadn't, and they found out that I did it because they saw my father-in-law's uh, Facebook post. So wow. I, made sure to invite, I made sure to invite them this time, and they came. Yeah, I bet that went over well. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it's, a, it's a joke that they what, Was that a phone up. call, an uh, awkward moment, or when, well, how did that go down? I think down? they tried to, they were, they were living overseas, so okay. they weren't going to make it anyway, and I knew that I was going to be, you know, here today in a couple years, um, but they, they, I think they tried to play it cool, but I know that they were a little bit upset that I, their own son didn't tell them that he was walking to get his master's degree. So, so I made sure to let them know way ahead of time. So what'd time. you do this weekend, Evan? Oh, nothing. No, <laughs> walked, went to, went to Outback, went to Outback. It was yeah. good. <laughs> I mean, I got, yeah, a, I got a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Cur curled up, you know, with a little ribbon on it or whatever they put on top of it as well. Let's discuss some things that, again, what Evan also does is amazing with what he does on, uh, at, at Evan, M-I-Y-A, by the way, on Twitter, but, and online, all the stats and trends and analytics. Let's start with basketball. Paul asked you this question earlier. Matthew Meyer has still not made up his mind. He can make up his mind. He can end up playing somewhere else collegiately. He can go to the NBA and stay there or continue there. And who knows if that door might still be cracked open at Baylor. How much does he swing anybody who may get him, whether it's North Carolina we hear about or anyone else? How much does he swing the pendulum? I think he's considered to be a really good transfer, probably top 15, top 20 consensus. My personal analytics have him as the number one best available transfer uh, because I think he has been really underrated on the defensive end of the ball last year and this year in terms of his impact for Baylor's defense when he's on the floor. They're just so, so much better uh, on a per possession basis defensively, not to mention his statistics that he accrues on the defensive end. And we as Baylor fans who watch him every game know his offensive potential. You know, it was a little bit disappointing this year in terms of the actual efficiency that he had shooting from the field, but we know he's capable of it. And the underlying numbers suggest that he can do that again. So when you put that together, his offense and his really high level defense, I think he's going to be an absolutely massive piece for any team that gets him if he ends up leaving Baylor. You, you had uh, Kendra Davis, uh, who's going to Memphis at number two. And Memphis need needed somebody like that, didn't they? Because they, well, they they greatly underachieved, and you know half of their good recruits don't show up anyway, and all the weird things that are going on there. But but what do you think he can do for Memphis, kicking them up? Memphis hasn't had a reliable point guard in a while. And especially given how tenacious they are on defense and how sporadic they have been on offense under Penny Hardaway, Kendrick Davis is going to be a game changer for them. Uh, I mean, he's been really, really good for SMU, and I think it's a little disappointing for him that he hasn't you know, gotten to play more prolific games over the last couple of years. So for him to be now with Memphis, I think that's a huge piece for them. Offensively, he's just uh, incredible. He's going to be able to facilitate and score lots of leadership. So it's a big piece for them. Evan, uh, obviously Baylor's been very active uh, with with their transfers. Um, just what are your thoughts on on them bringing in what Caleb Loner, uh, also Jalen Bridges as well? Uh, what kind of impact? Where do you see them fitting into the grand scheme of things? Yeah, I really like Jalen Bridges, especially uh, at my website. I rate all uh, transfers with a star ranking, kind of similar to what you'll see in high school, and he's one of the few five star transfers that I had available. So. I think he was a little bit underappreciated this year at West Virginia. I think he's going to be a big piece for Baylor, especially with some of the pieces that they're losing to the draft and potentially to the transfer portal. So I think that piece especially is going to be good. Um, and you know that Scott Drew, he chases the right pieces. He doesn't just grab anybody. And in today's age in the transfer portal, there's so little research, I think, that's really going into guys that coaches are pursuing. And you know that Baylor's taking – uh, the extra step in doing their due diligence. So I have a lot of confidence that those guys are going to be able to step in and be big pieces for them. Do you feel like they fill in the shoes of a Matthew Meyer, a James Akinjo? Do you feel like they're at the same level they were prior to those guys' departures with who they brought on? I do think it's probably a step down. Um, you know, I, I, James Akinjo and Meyer were both really, really good. Um, I, you know, as I said earlier, I think Meyer was underappreciated by a lot of people this year in terms of his impact on the floor, even if he wasn't the main scoring threat. Uh, but I do think those are two pieces that really do help cover a lot of those holes, too. So it's going to be really interesting to see, especially with the new freshmen they have coming in, you know, kind of what that chemistry looks like at the beginning of the season. And, of course, Sohan and Brown as well yeah. on their way out yeah. Um, yeah. as well. Yeah. How much can you or can you yet with incoming freshmen, can you put that into perspective yet with what you do with your analytics because of what Keontae George, the young guard from Kilgore College, how much he plays – 
How much can, can you do on that right now? There's a good amount. I don't have a uh, like next year um, team rankings out yet, but something that I'm able to do is along with the returning pieces that a team has and being able to project how good those players are, based on an incoming freshman's like recruiting profile, just based on how they're ranked according to different services, you can generally get a good sense of roughly how good they're gonna be and how much impact they're gonna have. And so that also plays a big piece into my early like preseason projections. I haven't run those numbers yet to kind of see which teams are at the top of the list, but usually if you have a freshman who's top 40, top 50, they're definitely gonna be something that raises your floor and gives you a lot of potential um, so, you know, some of these freshmen that Baylor come in, has come in, are definitely going to play a major part in kind of raising their level for next well, season. Look, Langston Love, we don't really know anything about either, you know, so that he's, you can kind of almost consider him a true freshman or like a, almost like he, I guess statistically maybe a JUCO yeah. transfer that you would look at as far as age and all those things. Yeah, absolutely. When, when Langston Love got injured last year before the season started, I think that dropped Baylor. I think I had Baylor, I don't know, sixth or seventh in the preseason and his absence for the rest of the season dropped them a couple spots so you just adding that back in is already going to make at least some sort of a tangible difference obviously it's a little bit of a wild card because of the recovering from the injury but you know that could be a major piece that not a lot of people are really expecting this year all right uh, from uh, alex brown congrats evan uh sarah mccoy congrats doctor scotty b yep congratulations evan uh here's one uh steven snook who i mentioned he does some pods he's a, a huge college football fan out of Cincinnati. He's from in, in Ohio. Dr. Miyakawa, this metrics and information is fascinating. I mean, he didn't know who you were until like five or six months ago. And now a lot of people, and I want to get to that. Daniel, congrats, Evan, and, and others as well. Um, now, speaking of which, uh, how much now, how many more people know who you are because of what you've done and you started to get quotes in the national writers and you put you know jeff goodman among others uh how much have you exploded nationally it's been a really really cool uh, it's definitely not something that i expected when i started my website a couple years ago i just really started it as kind of a an extension of what i was already doing in my free time which was sort of messing around with sports data you know while I'm getting a, a doctorate in statistics and so the amount of engagement that i've gotten especially from a lot of baylor fans has been really huge and now a lot of um, publications are referencing my metrics, whether that's evaluating team rankings or a lot of people are quoting me on uh, where different transfers are ranked according to my rankings, because you can see literally every single transfer where they're ranked amongst the thou you know, over a thousand transfers that are available. So I, you know, I see, you know, those rankings, you know, mentioned in publications all across the country. So it's been really, really cool. So, I mean, most of the, like, statistical sports thing kind of started with baseball and Bill James and those kind of things. Uh, and then, it, you know, it fed into other things, the analytics that they use in football and basketball and all that. Would you do another sport? Do you, are you have interest in doing other sports like this? I mean, baseball is might, might be done to death, uh, you know, but do you have interest in, in, in looking at it? Because different people have different looks on it, even statistically numbers-wise, of what's really important and what, what factors in. I'm always intrigued by other sports. Um, in fact, before I started doing uh, basketball analytics, I've always been a big fantasy football guy. Mm -hmm. And at some point, a couple of years ago, I built a an algorithm for uh, taking your, your teams from your fantasy league and then optimizing all the possible trades that you can make with another team and telling you which trades were most beneficial for you and another team. So I'm always thinking about ways to apply statistics in random ways to different sports. Um, so, yeah. you know, I've always been we'll, open to it. We'll, we'll talk after. I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a nine-year streak of not winning one. So. I'll hook you up. <laughs> you think you can help you? I, I mean, I, look, I'll, I'll make, take any help. I'm like Jerry Jones right now. Yeah. Whatever philosophy is going to yeah. help me, I'll try. Even if there's risks? Even if there's risks. Even if a guy's injured when you draft him? Yes. <laughs> Evan, what got you in? What, what made you interested in stats what what was it was it when you were younger something you saw how did that happen i've got to give credit to my parents who are here um they both got their master's degrees in statistics um at texas a m and they told me that i was reading numbers in the sports page in the newspaper when i was two wow uh, so they really indoctrinated me from a young age um and so i think i my upbringing really led me to have a love for combining math and stats with sports uh so it's really been something i've always loved partly because of my parents and the way they raised me did you both 
uh, mom and dad invite or make sure your parents knew about the master's degree program that you were getting when you when that time came? I just <laughs> I think they probably would have done a better job than I did, uh, <laughs> letting their family know. I had to get that in on you yeah, one you more time. Had to. Well, I mean, uh, like, look, they were in Lufkin, I and mean, that's not far from College Station, so it's not. <laughs> it's easy. Look, I'm on your side, Evan. I. <laughs> I almost didn't tell my parents to come. I, I thought I was just going to put a damper on my weekend. <laughs> Did it? No, no. <laughs> All right. We have uh, a lot of college sport, football to get to as far as guests to check in on programs. We've just checked in on most everyone we could imagine, and we'll do a little bit more of that as well. So the rest of the day, are you here for the rest of the day? You're going to spend the night. What, what's next? I'm here. Uh, some of my family's leaving tomorrow. I'll be here through the end of Sunday just kind of catching up with people and go into my church and all that good stuff, just kind of getting to hang out and wake up one more time before I move out to California in a couple weeks. Is that where you're going, huh? Yeah, yeah Santa Barbara, at, California. Yeah, Santa Barbara. Oh, Lord. If you ever want to visit and do wow. a show out there on the beach, just let me know. Don't say yeah. that. <laughs> we'll see you in July. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's that's just probably among the most beautiful views and beautiful places in of all the things that are beautiful in California. That doesn't get probably brought yeah. up enough. Yeah, a couple years ago, we went. we just went to lunch there one day. We did. We, we went down to the coast. Yeah, we did. We did. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, thanks for your time, man. Thanks for all you do. Now, just because you're now kind of like you hit the the j lottery, you still come on with us, right? Oh, absolutely. Well, you don't don't start like acting like you aren't able to come on with us. No, we'll hunt you Sikkim down. Sikkim 365 will always hold a special place in my heart, and you know that this was actually the first I think radio station or segment I ever did really? back in. January of 2021, I think. Um, so, you know, this has been a huge part of me, not only like growing, you know, as in terms of people knowing what I do, but just me personally growing and learning how to communicate and talk to people about sports. So it's yeah, been a great, good it, experience. It's one thing. And then you get in front of a camera or on the radio or cell phone, whatever it might be. We had you on Zoom a few times as well. Congratulations. We're very proud. We feel like, that, that, you know, you're like one of our children. I appreciate it. Well, not for these two guys. They're not old. Well, maybe they are. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Congratulations, man. Really, seriously. Dr. Miyakawa, what a great story. Got his doctorate today. Mom and dad, grandparents in the studio, father-in-law in the studio, and also back for the first time in probably about two years to check out what's going on in Waco with all the, all the ups and downs of uh, what's happening here with the construction. Coming up next, we'll get to a note about a former Texas offensive lineman. No, he's not a former... Texas player, but a former lineman at Texas who has a cut in story with Baylor and how the 2019 University of Texas recruiting class, another reason they've struggled, we'll have that for you. That's next, Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Alan Samuels, Dodge Chrysler, Jeep, Ram, Fiat, right now they're having their Memorial Day special savings going on for the rest of the month, including the 2022 Ram 1500 Lone Star quad cap. Total values of $7,000 or get $2,500 in bonus cash and 0% financing for 60 months. First responders get an extra $500 in cash. Also, the 2022 Wagoneer Series 2 or 3, 2.9% for 72 months and $3,000 bonus cash. And first responders, again, get an extra $500 in savings. Ted Teague, the general manager, go by and say hi to the great staff. AJ's the one that sold me a car there. It's Alan Samuels, Dodge Chrysler, Jeep Ram Fiat, Loop 340, east of 84 in Waco. Baylor University is where lights shine bright. So let there be light. Let there be roommates and teammates, scholarship and championships. Let there be fresh starts and new traditions, fast friendships and lasting impacts. Let there be laughter. Let there be joy. Let there be light. Baylor University, where lights shine bright. From the first workout to the last practice, sports is an incredible and rewarding challenge. Hi, this is Dan Ingham with the First National Bank of Central Texas, and we're proud to support each athlete, every parent, and our educators. From families, small businesses, to the biggest industry, we're here to help. With remarkable products like our free First Mobile app, we've got banking ideas that fuel big dreams. That's the First National Bank of Central Texas. Familiar faces making local decisions. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. Boots add protection. Good boots help you climb better and move forward faster. And when your son or daughter steps into the boots of a U.S. Army officer, they also learn how to lead. 
In these boots, they'll gain more confidence with expert training in one of more than 150 occupational specialties. In these boots, they'll stand a little taller and lead a team with diverse backgrounds and areas of expertise to successfully accomplish whatever challenge comes next. In these boots, they'll earn respect with valuable experience from day one that will give them solid footing for success into the future. Highly qualified candidates who earn a spot on our team can receive comprehensive health care coverage, college tuition assistance, and a bonus of up to $40,000. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. Automatic Chef Canteen is a full-service micro-market vending and office coffee provider with state-of-the-art vending equipment, a wide variety of products, and offering custom-fitted micro-market vending office coffee solutions for your employee break room. You want a full break room solution and a workplace oasis? Well, Automatic Chef Canteen, locally owned and operated for over 50 years in Central Texas, also includes in-house mechanics on call 24-7 for fast, reliable service and maintenance. Automatic Chef Canteen, 6900 Imperial Drive in Waco or online at automaticchefcanteen.com. Camille Johnson Realtors guide you seamlessly through the process of buying your dream home or selling your current one. Commercial, farm and ranch, or residential, Camille Johnson Realtors can smoothly and successfully lead you through any transaction. With a team of 28 experienced agents who are excited about serving you, Camille Johnson Realtors services the entire greater Waco area. If you're in the market to buy or sell, contact Camille Johnson Realtors, 104 Midway Center in Woodway, or find them online at www.camillejohnson.com. Camille Johnson Realtors, elegant, charming, Warm. Welcome home. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics. The team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports-related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non-athletes alike, whether it's knee or shoulder pain, hand or wrist injury, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trusts. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, wants to get you back in the game. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel? Search 365 Sports on YouTube. All right, here we go. Thanks to Dr. Miyakawa. We've been calling him that really since he was able to defend his dissertation back in January. Great story. Family was fantastic. They're having tacos tonight. And his grandmother has been cooking tacos. She told me she specializes 59 years and i said they're crispy right she goes oh a, that's the only kind are the crispy tacos but of course there's a lot of different options of that as well baylor men's tennis tonight at the herd tennis facility uh, i believe it will start at 6 30 baylor and stanford round of 16 the ncaa men's national tournament will be part of that in waco tonight stanford and baylor now, well, they should win. I mean, they're the higher seed. They're at home. You would think that that uh, gives them, you know, the advantage of uh, being at home and also being the, you know, better ranked team. But, you know, it's the postseason, so you never know how it works out. But uh, I know Michael Woodson wasn't exactly satisfied with last weekend's showing, so I'd expect a pretty sharp effort tonight against the Cardinal. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd anticipate them, them winning tonight. But, hey, you're in the round of 16, so you never know. So it'll be it'll be tough, but I imagine it'll be a very lively atmosphere. When I saw Stanford, and I have great respect for their athletic department, of course their endowment allows them to, to be incredibly successful as well with some of the scholarship sports that are non. They don't get the full rides. Stanford, Baylor is 11-2. I said 18-3. 11-2 all time against Stanford. Last time they met was in 2018. The Cardinal – has won, have won each of the last two matchups. They have, in their history, 17 team titles. But Baylor's 11-2 and two against them all time. When you get into the, non, the non-revenue sports, yeah. playing, playing Stanford to me is always daunting because they care about that stuff much more than everybody else does in a, in a sense of supporting it 
at, at, a, at an institutional it's level. It's why they're relevant athletically. Yeah. I mean, to be perfectly honest, you know, their football team's good on occasion. David Shaw does a good job. They, John Elway back in the day, you know, they've got a history. Um, who's the running back? Just, uh, you know, a few years. McCaffrey. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they have a, a great history, but – um, you know, they are mostly known, though, for like, hey, we've got 25 national championships. Oh, what, and when what? Volleyball, <laughs> swimming, you know, all the stuff Every, that's... Rowing. Yeah, soccer, all the non-revenue yeah. sports. They kill it. And that's why they, for years and years growing up, they were always when the Sears Cup was a thing, uh, whatever it's called now, I don't pay as much attention to it, but when it was the Sears Cup and it seemed like kind of a big deal, it was always them. And then there was Texas and... You know, a few others that were familiar, but Stanford is usually like number one or number two because they'd kill it in all the sports that most people don't even have. Um, but but yeah, they're they're good and um, you know top twenty. So Baylor's got to be on their A game tonight. Well, well, and and they you know they have to recruit a different kind of athlete. Yeah, and yeah. and especially for foot like. You know, especially for football, when you're talking about 85 of them, and you know, on average, you know, at 25 a year, when you're recruiting guys that are going to meet that academic standard and all that, sometimes, you know, um, you know, I mean, you're not going to necessarily go into the five stars. And I'm not saying that like five star guys are all dumb, but they may not be Stanford smart. Well, you know, their football team has to get back going, and David Shaw will most likely get that done. But they, it's been a couple of years where they've struggled. Yeah, they, they won that. Well, I believe this changed names a little bit. It might be different now, of course. I think now, it's like Texas Learfield won, or something, but Te it was. Texas won it the most recent time. Yeah, but yeah. I don't. I, it was a bigger deal, I feel like, about 15 years ago, the Sears Cup, when it was the Sears Cup. I, at least I paid more attention to it back then. I don't even know where to find it now. Um, maybe because of the name change, it take, it's, you know, I'm just dumb like that. But It's the Learfield Director's Cup is okay, what they call yeah, it yeah. now. It's yeah. the Sears Cup to me, but yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're a solid athletic program, and they do have a lot to deal with that others do not have to deal with, and they, they make their way around that. And every once in a while, they'll pop up and have a pretty good football team as well, and um, they're kind of due for that. I, I think, you know, it's not, to, not a lot to write home about the last year or two. Stanford won it. <laughs> this is crazy. Stanford won it every year from 1994-95 school year. North Carolina won it the year before, the first year. Every single year. Yep. Then there was the COVID year. Nobody did it. And then Texas was one Stanford two last year. So that's, that's pretty damn impressive. The better, and I'll mention this, and I want to get to a story about the, Oklahoma, uh, the uh, Texas offensive line and what's also been one of their problems that they hope this year when they signed a bunch of guys – um, Stanford, Florida, UCLA, North Carolina, Michigan, Texas, and USC are the ones seven with the most top ten rankings among what was the Sears Directors Cup and now the Learfield Cup. Nobody within the middle part of the country. It's all teams on coasts or uh, borders, you know, Michigan up there with the Canadian border, but everybody's on the coast somewhere practically of the, the teams that you mentioned. I mean, no, Austin's not the coast, yeah. but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I think I could have picked off five of those. Michigan might be one I would have probably struggled with in getting them. It's pretty impressive, very impressive. All right, now, Texas, they signed all of those blue chippers uh, this past year, whatever it's called now with their uh, class in February or December and February. Here's one reason they had to do that, but you always want to bring in as many offensive linemen as you can. Isaiah Hookfin, highly rated offensive lineman. He now has a medical retirement, according to head coach Steve Sarkeesian. There will now be only five players from the 2019 class playing for Texas this upcoming season. And every offensive lineman from the 2019 class has transferred or medically retired. That's why I'm not I'm not so bullish on them. You know, re completely redefining themselves because while they do have a lot of they've got a lot of good transfers and they're going to be a lot more. You know, they're going to be very dynamic on offense at the skill positions and all that. Um, those are the things that you need veterans on your team, and those are guys who would be juniors this year. And so you're, you're, you know, you have a junior class that's pretty decimated and not there. That's not just about, you know, the guys on top. Sometimes it's about the, the veteran leadership and the meat of the team right there in the middle. That's what Texas doesn't have yet. Now, while I think they'll be better this year, th that's precisely why. It's not about, oh, that Xavier Worthy and, and everybody else can't make them better this year. And uh, Ajay Hall and, and Isaiah Nayor and Bijan coming back yeah. and all that. 
uh, Quinn Ewers, all those things will probably make them better. But, you know, will they be good? Good. Will they be contenders? Because if you look at it, the teams that win, look, Baylor won the conference last year with a veteran team. The other teams that were in contention for that, outside of Iowa State, who we thought that's what one of the reasons we picked them was they're a veteran team. You know, Oklahoma State, pretty veteran team. Those guys have all been together a while. Uh, that's that's how it works uh, for, for the most part. Look, Alabama wins national titles. You know why? Because, you know, they've got skilled players that come and go, and that's true, but they've got four- and five-star guys that stay four years and build leadership on that team and experience. They have uh, – there are times, like with other teams, and not, not, not just Texas, but – I do think also that there have been also offensive linemen they have signed that are really, really good, and some of them have turned out to be good. I also think at times that they have had offensive linemen that were overrated uh, in the rating system. Uh, yeah, they, they have. Uh, I've, we've talked about it before. There are certain bumps given on occasion to, to players uh, because of who they're being recruited by, and it's very obvious, and it becomes even more obvious in some cases, and Isaiah Hookfin was one of those. That was... Uh, a situation where Baylor and Texas were doing it out for him. I recall he was a late bloomer as far as the recruiting goes. Um, I don't remember who was on him first. I want to say it was Baylor, and they had the advantage, it looked like, and then here came Texas. And, um, you know, all of a sudden, he, like, ends up signing with them, and his ranking shoots up like two stars. P post senior year basically and I was like whoa, whoa, whoa wait wait a second and that was just one of many signs I had seen you know before and even after uh, where you know I I'm not trying to disparage th those who do rankings and all of that but th there's just blatantly obvious in some cases that some guys get bumps because of where they're going and it's just obvious and uh, Hook Finn's massive rise I just you know I'm sure the excuse was well he didn't go to camps or you know he didn't do this or that and I'm sure you know some of that's true like if a guy's not going out to camps and how are these people supposed to find him but for him to just go from like basically unknown to four star um in signing with Texas was that was silly to me um now as far as hook Finn goes uh, I feel bad for him because apparently he was in a really bad uh accident a few months back in December and uh, got a lot of bumps and bruises and think some broken bones and got pretty messed up. And I uh, believe there was a tweet out there where he had commented on the fact that he was wearing his helmet and that it basically saved him from, you know, worse damage and, and maybe even death, the, the way that it sounded. And I think he, like, gave a shout-out to the, the motorcycle helmet company or something like that, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly. But, yeah, he had a bad accident, and I don't know if that's what fully played into his medical retirement um, I'm sure it probably played some role in that. So, you know, definitely not going to celebrate that. But I am going to remember him as somebody that was an example of just how wonky the rankings can kind of get, you know, for yeah, certain he was, teams. He wasn't rated for the longest of time, and then all of a sudden, Pop is just one boom. of the top 50 players in Texas. Now, a tie into Baylor. Craig mentioned that Baylor was kind of maybe in on, I think, Houston – uh, Texas Tech also. No, Hookfin was Texas yeah. and Baylor. No, no, I'm I'm talking uh, about offers and things like that. But it was that was Texas, Texas, Texas. And here's the story about that. He was going to he was going to be a silent commitment. He was a silent commitment to Baylor. He was going to sign on whatever day that was. I don't know if it was early national signing period or if it was the one in February. He was signing with Baylor. It would have been a big flop as far as switch. It would have been a huge coup for Baylor. And he informed even some people who covered Baylor that he would be signing with Baylor, but to keep it quiet, a silent commitment, because he was supposed to sign with UT. Somebody in the media did not read the memo, mentioned it, it pissed him off, he signed with Texas. And unfortunately, his career now a medical red shirt but that's amazing five players left from the 2019 class and it might be more attrition like that than we think around the country but every offensive lineman in the class of 2019 has transferred and you want to know another story about that baylor in 2019 that was the team coming off the awful they were seven and six and one time they had six scholarship offensive linemen now they have an offensive line that seems to be loaded and here we are under Eric Mateos and what they're doing. Texas should be absolutely embarrassed uh, of their offensive line in comparison to Baylor's now that you just mentioned that. They, yeah, they really should be. I mean, they've been building up their offensive line and getting way bigger, better blue-chip prospects on paper the last few years than Baylor's been getting. But it just goes to show you got to have the right coach. 
Baylor's offensive line was bad for about four or five years in a row. And then finally this last year with Mateos uh, and a couple of transfers, they were able to be good enough to go win a Big 12 title. So it can be done, but you got to have the right combination. And I don't know if their combination has just been multiple misses in recruiting and, you know, medical retirements and whatnot, or if it's been, you know, coaching. It's, I'm sure it's a combination of all those things. But, yeah, that's been a problem for them. And it's their glaring weakness going into this year right now. They signed, you know, a great recruiting class. But, okay, so did they in 2019. And 2019, they had Brew McCoy. And they had Jake Smith. I remember how hyped up he got. Jake Smith didn't do anything at Texas. I mean, you look at their 2019 class. Mm -hmm. Brew McCoy transferred, Jake Smith transferred, Tyler Johnson, who's an offensive lineman, transferred, Tyler Owens transferred, Kenyatta Watson transferred, Marcus Washington transferred, Chris Adamora transferred, Myron Warren transferred, Javon Shepard, another offensive lineman, that was a big win over AM, transferred, Marcus Tillman transferred, Caleb Johnson, Kennedy Lewis, Marcus Caldwell, Jared Wiley, Willie Tyler, Juwan Mitchell, transfer, transfer, transfer. Then you have one starter out of 26 players that you signed, one starter, Jordan Whittington. And he's and he's unfortunately he's a tremendous talent. Off and on, off, as far as yeah. health goes, you had four medical retirements: to Gabriel Floyd, Darian Brown, Hook Finn, and then Peter and Poggy. And then you've got four guys from that class that are on your two deep. And this is from C.J. Vogel uh, with Roshan Johnson, who's been very good, Tavondre Sweat, Braden Lebrock, and David Gabenda. But out of your 26 man number three in the country ranked yep. recruiting class, you've got out of 26 one starter. And four players on the two deep. And then they did send one to the NFL, um, I believe. But, I mean, that's horrific percentages. That is just dreadful uh, how that class has turned out. And that's, you know, part of why they are. And this is not bashing on Texas. It's just that's that's why, you, you know, you're not living up to what, you know, the class should have lived up to. That's why I think they need to take away that little extra star bump from them just to be fair to Texas. Yeah. It's not it like... It is, Dude, that hook fin thing was wild. The way yeah. he was, like, that was crazy. Yeah, I mean, it just just to be fair to Texas, take it away. It's not fair. Like they are the mountain of their own expectations combined with the mountain of the expectations of the football world, who hasn't noticed what's really going on there, has created a situation that's that's hard for especially young athletes that come in. You've heard ex Texas exes say like, look, they've they're entitled. They didn't do anything. It's not two thousand five anymore. You know they need, but to it's not as if they don't push back on the the, 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 the rankings and yeah. they, they, they. But again, Coach Sarkeesian, he is now in charge of trying to maybe flip that switch. Yeah, Herb Hand, a very decorated offensive line coach, is there. But again, they struggled with that last year, and they have all the weapons. Can they protect? Enough to throw the ball and run the ball. We got to get to a guess. You got one more thing to close it out? Um, yeah, I mean, Sarkeesian said, I guess, on one of these little tour stops they've done lately, it was just interesting to hear him commenting on not doing a good enough job as far as the relationship building goes. And it just made me think of Dave Aranda. And uh, I, I'm curious if Sarkeesian's taken any pointers or picked up on any pointers or others out there have. You know, we've talked about that, just Aranda's unique approach to uh, how he turned things around in year two. And I'm curious to see if others kind of not copy that, but take notes from that. And when I hear Sarkeesian talk about relationship building, that could have come from anywhere, not necessarily Dave Aranda. But it did strike me because that's what changed for Aranda was the relationship part of it. And if Sarkeesian can get that relationship part down and get rid of all the BS hype and all of the, you know, the logo crap that hasn't done them any favors, quite frankly, for, you know, well, what year are we are? 17 years now? No, well, that's not fair because no, Colt like McCoy. 12 years, 12, 12 years. Okay, it's still 12 years, yeah. you know. That's, that's more than a decade that we're talking about here. It's not like a couple years. If they can get rid of that and just get down to business and the real, you know, hey, relationships and – uh, and doing all those types of things, then then I think that's the right approach, and maybe they'll be on to something. Yeah, all those kids in, that, that we talked about with Colt McCoy last week that are named after him are all 12 years old. Yeah. They're in sixth grade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Approaching high school. That's yeah. crazy. All right, when we come back, uh, Jed Drenning, sideline reporter for West Virginia football. We mentioned the five schools according to an article in ESPN, and everyone's had their five. Paul said his the five best of the five worst, but it was something else to bring up on this Friday afternoon. West Virginia among four college programs we drop into and kind of see what's going on, including Ryan Abraham and USC at 520. And we'll have Jed Drenning on West Virginia post-transfer portal and also where they are. Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. 
Y'all listen up. Let me tell you something about group meals from Rudy's Barbecue. It's got all you need for all the folks you gotta feed, smoke, meat, sides, and more. There's everything down to the tablecloth, just like the one that you see at the store. At a bridal shower, it's better than flowers. And a long business meeting, it'll pass the hours. It'll feed all the cousins at a family function. It's better than potluck at a church luncheon. Next time you need to feed 10 or more, call and order a Rudy's group meal. Next in line. Hey, this is Bryce Petty, former starting quarterback and two-time Big 12 champion. And I know firsthand the importance of being in top shape both on and off the field. So listen up, men. If you're feeling beat down day in and day out and looking for that high-performance edge that separates the men from the boys, then look no further than the Petty Clinic Low T in Waco. Petty Clinic is a comprehensive men's health care clinic with an atmosphere catering to men. Board-certified Dr. Kent Petty has a special interest in offering the highest quality medical care to men of all ages. Some of the services offered include screening and treatment for low testosterone or thyroid, infertility, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, while offering comprehensive wellness exams and complete men's health lab panels. High performance men, remember, it's not just a petty thing. This is Bryce Petty, encouraging you to reach out and Google search Petty Clinic Low T or go to PettyClinicLowT.com and get your complimentary lab screening today. With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Niche Group Insurance Agency. With the Niche Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Niche Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts at the Niche Group at 1-800-258-8302. Do you or your kids get nervous about going to the dentist? Stonewood Dental, Dr. Steve Childress, he can help. I've spent a career taking care of patients who as children had bad experiences, and now they're adults that hate going to the dentist. If I get a kid at three years old, and they come every six months, and it's a happy experience, it's normal for them. Now they have an accident at six or seven or eight at school. Now they have a broken tooth or a trauma, and they have to come here they're used to lights, they're used to water in their mouth, they're used to experience, they already trust us. It's amazing what we can do with that kid without it being a negative thing. But if I see a six or seven or eight year old that's never been to the dentist, and now they have a trauma or an unfortunate unexpected toothache, it's harder to do that for that kid and it not be somewhat of a negative experience. So bottom line is I try to teach kids and adults and teenagers and everybody the way I'd want my family treated, which is where it's a necessary part of life. You just take care of it. It doesn't have to be that big a deal. Learn more. Stonewood-Dental.com. You know what would make this moment better? Pizza. Dough made from scratch and an Italian family sauce recipe pizza. Three fresh signature cheeses making a melty blanket of perfect pizza. Bob Mock has owned Marco's Pizza franchises since 2013 and has been delivering pizza since 2001 and is the proud owner of four locations in the Waco area in Belmede, China Spring, Woodway, and soon to be open in Robinson. Order at Marco's.com to make any moment better. Marcos, pizza lovers get it. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Jet motion they go with here with Baldwin. And Baldwin breaks free. And the Bears, Sikkim, Monterey Baldwin. The 4 o'clock hour is sponsored by Boozer's Jewelers, the wedding ring store, specializing in custom jewelry and repair, all in-house. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. Before we get to uh, Jed running on West Virginia, Kyle Flood, University of Texas offensive line coach. Herb Hand is now at UCF. Kyle Flood was in Alabama for, what, two, three years or so when Sarkeesian was there and also a part of the, some of those great teams at Alabama. Last year, about this time, I think I made a comment about whoever the defensive coordinator is at Texas, and some of the fans went nuts, and you probably at times last year with the defense struggling wondered it yourself. All right, so Kyle Flood, hell of a coach, and now he's the one in charge of trying to get that offensive line to where they need to be. Jed Drenning, sideline reporter, West Virginia football, joins us in Sikkim 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Jed, I saw a list today. And we've had ours. You probably have had yours. Everyone, top 
teams post transfer portal, whatever, and then the ones that struggle the most. Does West Virginia have enough with what they have gotten back from what they have lost to at least tread water? Well, the short answer is yes, but you know, I start with this. Uh, don't you kind of pine for the days just a short few years ago where we spent the off season? You know, it was consumed with conversations about realignment, playoff expansion, <laughs> and now here we go. Our lives have been entirely taken over by this roster management conversation, right? Yeah, that's yep. that's the new reality, and that's the soup in which we all now swim. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, when you look at the pros and the cons, and the gains and the losses, uh, that's the nature of the beast. Uh, you're going to have, uh, you know, some major transformations uh, each year. You're going to have a fundamentally new football team each year. Now, coaches have always said, you know, hey, don't don't judge us on anything we did last year in the past because this is a new team. That's never been more true than now in, in this modern era. So just like most of the rest of the country, uh, we lost some pieces uh, through the portal, uh, most on some level maybe – somewhat anticipated uh, a couple maybe not but we also gained several and, and not just smoky this year but even in recent years when you look along our offensive line you know uh we got a transfer guard a couple of years ago and doug nestor from virginia tech who came back home to, to the mountain state to play for the mountaineers and, and we have jaquay hubbard who's a transfer tackle from uva who is competing and contention for a starting right tackle spot so even in recent years, going back to Will Greer and beyond, you know, we've benefited from just transfers in general. Uh, but now that things are, are more in flux and more uh, dynamic than ever, uh, you really have to be on top of how you manage your roster, and that's where Neil Brown comes in. Uh, he has tremendous attention to detail, uh, and, and I think that he's he's found a, a puncher's way to, to kind of stay competitive and put us in position uh, to really come out swinging and, and see what we can do and see if we can be competitive in November and go from there. Jed, I only ask this question because a lot of the West Virginia fans that, that watch our show comment on Neil Brown all the time, but it feels to me that there's a tepid response at best to him so far, uh, but that might not be considering all the factors that he's had to deal with in his very short tenure at West Virginia. How do you feel the fans are responding to Neil Brown and what does he need to do to make sure that that temperature raises a little bit? Well, you know, Coach Brown will be the first to tell you that, you know, we've got to win some big games, and that's what will captivate fans. And he, he loves the fact that, you know, he, he coaches for a program that's attached to a fan base that really, really cares, okay? And attached to uh, that, that care from the fan side are expectations, okay? And he realizes, look, I have to deliver on those expectations. They're not going to wait forever. Uh, irrespective of what kind of rebuild I might have been looking at. Because what happened was, when Neil was hired in 2019, you know, he recognized and embraced uh, the, the traditional challenges that West Virginia faces that we've, at our best, been able to overcome. I mean, we're a developmental program. We get kids with chips on their shoulders that, that think that the guy that signed down the street that was a four-star or a five-star that they whipped in high school, they're better than him when they were rated a two- or three-star and we get those kids into our program with that ax to grind and develop those kids and churn out a lot of NFL talent and find a way to be competitive against these blue blood programs. Traditionally, at our best, that's what we've done. Now, Neil recognized in taking the job, there were challenges in trying to get to that, and he signed up for those challenges. Uh, well, new challenges, just like here and everywhere else, and I would say not just in the non-blue blood uh, uh, programs, but even at some level in the blue blood programs, new challenges have presented themselves with NIL, with the portal. So you've had to address them on the fly and pivot and adjust on the move. And, and I think he's trying to do that. So now let's look and see if, in fact, we have an upper-level elite quarterback in JT Daniels, which it appears that, that that's what he can be. You know, at his best, he's that kind of guy. He's a difference-making quarterback. Uh, and, and that's not, you know, uh, to disrespect uh, Jared Dagey, who gave us a lot of quality snaps and a lot of quality production and, and he was a mainstay for us offensively, uh, I'm just not so sure that he's a difference maker. If you surround him with the appropriate supporting cast, he's going to win some football games for you, and he did. And he made some plays for us. Uh, but JT Daniels, maybe he is that difference maker. And it, this is probably the first time, if in fact that's the case, that we'll be judging Neil with that difference-making quarterback behind center. And that's when you truly find out what a coach might be all about. 
Sticking with uh, JT Daniels, the difference maker, how much does he change just the feel, the energy, and the perception versus had they been at the same point in the offseason and JT Daniels was not a part of the plans next year? Like, how much does he spruce up the expectations? Because it seems like that gave the program a real jolt. Yeah, it did. And, and you know, it, from a timing standpoint, you could argue that, well, we wish he was here in the spring to rep with the ones and, and maybe get in sync with things. But, you know, maybe you can look at it the other way. If you want to look at it as a glass-half-full situation, we have three talented young quarterbacks who are vying for reps, vying for snaps, and trying to work their way up the pecking order. And they were kind of left to their own devices to split those snaps without JT around. And those were all quality snaps. So the, the fact that JT committed when he did, to your point, really energized the fan base, I think energized the program at large. Uh, there was a positive vibe immediately surrounding things. Uh, even on the recruiting front, we've made some inroads. There's been a lot of positive progress there. Uh, of course, it's ongoing in the portal by, I mean, the 23 class looking into next year from the high school standpoint. So, yeah, it, it changed the perspective, and it was a big deal. I mean, it's, it's not often that you have an opportunity to lure in, you know, uh, a five-star former recruit, right? A uh, kid that was the only player in history to be named Gatorade National Player of the Year as a junior. Uh, so how can you not be excited about that to invite that kind of guy into your program, not just maybe make your room that much better, but maybe even take it to a whole new level? How much do you almost count Graham Harrell as a transfer? Well, it's a good way of putting that, Smokey. You know? uh, first of all, on some level, uh, you'd have to think he's tethered to JT Daniels, right? I mean, the, the relationship that they had was pre-existing from their days at USC, uh, and he spent that entire off season with Graham Harrell coming out of high school, or excuse me, coming out of high school into that freshman season. And uh, so they did have time to go, excuse me, into his sophomore season, that season opener, JT Daniels' sophomore season. That whole off season was with Graham Harrell learning this system. Uh, but, you know, the addition of Graham Harrell in the off season, that might be the spark plug that offensively we needed. A lot of the pieces – it appeared at times we're in place. And at our best, we were productive. But but things just didn't click. I mean, we lacked the big play capability to help us get off the field quickly enough. So we were kind of put in position that we had to string long drives together. Uh, that's obviously, as you guys know, the long way around. Mm -hmm. That's a tough road to hoe. If you can bail yourself out with some 50, 60 yarders, get off the field quickly, well, you're not out there long enough to make the mistakes that you might otherwise make. All of a sudden, these false starts don't start stacking up and lead to the third and 12s and third and 13s and force, force into bad situations. So that's what Graham Harrell is. He brings that, again, traditional air raid in the sense that he's going to push the football downfield. I, I, I'm intrigued with Graham by the fact that he, he meshes well those traditional air raid concepts. And again, remember, Neil Brown's an air raid guy too. I mean, you're talking about two former players under Mike Leach. Uh, but he also meshes some NFL concepts, you know. Uh, he spent some time in the NFL. He spent some time in Canada. So he's a well-rounded guy, comes from a, a family of coaches, uh, brings a, a tremendous perspective, and, and really has coached the room well. You know, he, he has a track record of uh, getting the best out of the guys in the room, whether that's Mason Fine as a true freshman at North Texas, or whether that was the series of true freshmen that he encountered at USC. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see what he can do with what we believe is a talented room at West Virginia and take advantage of some of the weapons, some of the big-bodied guys that we got on the perimeter. We think we have some weapons in place, irrespective of some of the attrition that we've suffered in that room. I mean, we lost the slot. We lost the wideout. But we're pretty comfortable. I think the staff's pretty comfortable with what we have from a potential production standpoint in that room. Plus, there's a couple other JC kids they're going to be on campus in the summer. They're going to be an instrumental part of that kind of plug-and-play type kid. So we're excited about the potential that room brings, uh, especially when, you, when it coincides uh, with the new look of Graham Harrell's playbook. Where do you think that they are still deficient? Well, depth's going to be an issue uh, at a great many areas. It, it really is. I mean, if you ask me, okay, what, what, what positions would they still be targeting uh, now and through the summer uh, in the portal? Uh, well, obviously corner, and I would even say offensive tackle from a depth standpoint. And it, isn't it strange that that's probably always going to be the case? I say it's strange that those are, if you ask me, if you're building a program, those are two of the first three positions you need, right? You need a quarterback, you need an offensive tackle to protect the quarterback, and you need a corner, okay? And maybe edge rusher as well. I'd throw in there as well. But those are the types of things that in a modern era, I mean, when, when you have a Rose Bowl played with Utah, starting a running back at corner against Ohio State, 
that's just the new reality. These rooms are going to lack depth. It's not going to be ideal. It's going to be insufficient at times. And you're never going to be done and feel comfortable that you are as deep as you need to be across the board. You're really not. So we would still be on the hunt for another corner, even though I, I think from the top down, we have talented kids. When you look at our back end, we did lose some experience. We have some longer kids there, but we lack the experience. We're excited about their explosiveness, their playmaking ability. I think defensively, we might be in position to try some things that we haven't in recent years tried, maybe man up a little more and bring some more bodies from a pressure package standpoint. I mean, what some teams started to do last year against this guys, I mean, you saw Baylor do a tremendous job of this uh, with Jeff Grimes and the plan that he put together. They started to max protect against this, okay, and simplify the routes and really try and place stress on our secondary with the extra time to allow those routes to develop. And we didn't have much of an answer for it because we were more of a zone defense. So it was difficult for us to manufacture that extra pressure. So with these body types that we now have populating that back end, even though they're young, there is the chance that they'll put us in position to be a little more creative when teams try try and do that and have an answer. Play some man, bring some extra pressure packages, and maybe uh, try and resolve that. So we'll see where it goes, but you're still going to try and address certain needs no matter what you have on the active roster on any given day. Jed, I know it's been a little while now, but were you surprised at all when Dante Stills announced that he was going to be coming back, and what a coup that is? Uh, Yes and no. And I look at it in the sense that you would have thought that coming out his brother would have been more coveted and more successful than what he has been at the next level, Mm -hmm. okay? Uh, You know, when you look at the awards that he won on, on, on the conference level in the Big 12, Darius, uh, but that hasn't taken shape. So I think from that, Dante looked at his brother's experience, uh, you know, who went undrafted and said, you know what, I need to make the absolute most of every opportunity I have on tape. And that, that factored into his decision, coming back for one more year to really dot the I's, really cross the T's, really appreciate and understand exactly what it is that those scouts covet, that those scouts look for, that those scouts want you to show on tape. Uh, so that factored in, uh, but also I, I think there's some unfinished business when you talk to Dante. He's a Fairmont, West Virginia kid. He grew up, he's, he's a legacy kid. His dad was a tremendous pass rusher for us back in the 90s, Gary Stills. But he grew up around the program, 20 minutes south. He's always been a Mountaineer fan. There's some unbin- unfinished business there. So I, I think when you put all these things together, uh, it presented an opportunity for him to come back and make a difference and see what we can do in 2022. Jed, with the news that we knew Brigham Young's coming in next year, we know that's happening. Yeah. But now there appears to be, and Mac Rhodes even told us on Tuesday, and there was reports last week that perhaps Cincinnati, Houston, and also UCF come in in summer 2024. What's the reaction been in Morgantown that they're gonna? It's going to be next year. All four will join whatever Texas and Oklahoma as well. What's been the reaction, or has there been much? I I think there's some curiosity in the sense that, and it's strange that now it seems that in the news is uh, the Power Five leagues seem to have conversations flowing that that they're steering away from divisional play, right? Uh, Where, of course, the Big 12 doesn't have division. They're they're talking more about going toward a model like the Big 12's had and, and have one versus two in their leagues at the end of the year because there's been a curiosity among West Virginia fans if the Big 12 would one day steer toward divisional play and maybe give, give us some travel partners, and maybe that's what Cincinnati could serve as. And, and, you know, we were traditionally accustomed to traveling to Florida to play football. You know, we, we had Miami in the Big East. We had South Florida in the, in the latter Big East. So that's not foreign to West Virginia and West Virginia fans to add UCF and make that trip. So I think that curiosity as much as anything. I mean, first of all, it's, it, it's four very good football programs and very solid additions. They all bring different things to the table. So there's a lot to get excited about, and, and that's not salesmanship to say that. That's not lip service. When you look at the accomplishments of those four programs, first of all, who knows where any of this is landing? Who knows where any of this is heading? You now have Amazon with Thursday night football contracts with pro football. You're talking about Apple getting into the game. It, the TV doesn't rule the roost in the way that it one, once did. So maybe being nimble enough to not be tethered and tied and attached to a TV deal like the ACC has puts us in better position long-term with these new additions uh, to entertain some of these digital possibilities. I mean, who knows? I mean, right, the the, the landscape is changing under our feet almost on a daily basis. 
So I think in general, Mountaineer fans are excited about those types of brands. We're just excited to still have a seat at the table and, and be asked to play at the adult table. Because, again, when you look back to when the Big East eroded, when the Big East imploded, I should say, and fell apart, I mean, it would have been very easy to be UConn and be left behind, yep. right? Uh, and be left scrambling, but that wasn't the case. I mean, we found a way uh, to uh, uh, find a life preserver, land to the Big 12, still have a seat at that table. Uh, and moving forward, there's no reason to believe that won't continue. I think that takes precedent over anything else. You know, what's amazing is on the day that the Texas and Oklahoma and SEC story popped in late July, I didn't think about mm-hmm. just the team that we cover, the core of what we cover with Baylor. I thought about West Virginia, Iowa State, Kansas, Kansas State, Texas Tech, TCU, Oklahoma State, all of them. Because all yeah. of all of them kind of needed to, you know, one, maybe it's good for them to break away despite the money. We know that that's going to hurt. But it seemed like every one of them had to look around the room and go, okay, who else is staying here? And it looks like it, it looks like everyone is, hey, we got to stick together. And it looks like that's happened. And I think that's important. Yeah, I, I think there's some level of solidarity, and it, you know, perspective matters with these types of things. And I, I, I mean, I, I looked at it from a curiosity standpoint when you looked at the Iowa State or the KU's or or even Kansas State, Manhattan. Uh, things when you when you get further west, one thing we as West Virginians have learned is being big, part of the Big Twelve. You guys reckon distance much differently than we do. We're <laughs> we're we're a mid we're a mid Atlantic East Coast type of uh, brand, right? And, you know, everything, everybody's on top of each other. It's strange to say in, in the mountains of West Virginia, but the East Coast in general is pretty concentrated from a population density standpoint. And we're a lot closer to a lot of other schools and yep. programs that you, when you get out West, you're very spread out. So just that in itself lends to different possibilities, you know, just geographically. And, and I'm not so sure that's the case with some of the schools that, that might have found themselves in the crosshairs of things ended differently that are stuck kind of out in isolation like that geographically. So, and that's not even to say geography obviously rules today anymore. It certainly doesn't. Uh, it certainly doesn't. But it, it, that's one of the things that did cross my mind. But the solidarity that you're talking about, I think that's what's carried today. Uh, the, the fact that we all kind of did band together and decide. But, you know, you know, back to the topic at large, you know, when you're talking about what we've lost, what we've gained, I mean, this is the discussion that every fan base in America is taking or having. And, you know, guys, I, I think back, I remember I heard Bill Belichick, either he said it or I heard him said about him. This was years ago. But one of the things he was in the practice of doing, the head coach of the Patriots, of course, was leading up to the draft, he would host and entertain and interview a draft prospects that he really didn't feel they would be drafting. Okay, he thought the likelihood of the Patriots organization drafting these guys wasn't very high. Okay, in addition to the guys they were going to draft, they also interviewed and spent time with the guys they didn't. And his thinking was, well, first of all, he gained some insight into the type of person they were, what made them tick. Uh, And and the reason that mattered was once their rookie deal was up and they hit free agency, if they did, he already had a step ahead in terms of forging some relationship. Right. And that obviously served him well over the course of time. Well, I can't help but think that that's the way college coaches have to now approach this in the past. Maybe you got more upset than you probably should have. If you lost out on a high school senior in the next class, but you got to remember, you know, he's one sour conversation away from landing in your lap, you know, one year later now more than ever. Right. And you could argue maybe you're in better position because now he's kind of committed to you and it's not as easy for him to transfer again. So it's kind of changed maybe even some way the way that some coaches approach the whole thing. I, it's just all these things contribute to an ever-changing landscape that's nowhere near done changing. No, it's uh, every day. It's now a 12-month-a-year sport. Jed, you do a great job uh, covering West Virginia. Always love having you on the show. Thanks for hopping on with us today, and have a great weekend. Hey, you guys, too. I appreciate it, Smokey. We'll you. see you all. Jed Drenny, West Virginia sideline reporter with a bunch of good insight and knowledge on West Virginia. A lot of you in the chat room asking about various positions. I, mean, I tried to ask. We all did as much as we could. But uh, that's that's a, a school that, man, they've been close. And then they've also just kind of been there, you know. And mm-hmm. uh, they're teetering on 
getting try to get back if they can into the conversation. Well, I mean, they've had a lot of change. You know, Holgerson was there forever, and uh, he had a good thing going. And then that, you know, turned sour, and he went to Houston, and they bring in, you know, a new coach, and it takes a little bit of time. But, I mean, yeah, they haven't been what we – you know, would normally expect them to be these last couple of years, but there's still somebody on the schedule. When you see you got to go to Morgantown, you're like, okay, um, you know, better be ready for that one. Now, I will say some of that has, you know, fallen to the wayside. Some of that, oh, no, we got to go to Morgantown because they haven't been as good. But, you know, if they can um, – if, if JT Daniels can be just, you know, close to – doesn't have to be all the way to the five-star guy, but if he can be close to that, I mean, that makes a massive difference alone for them. I mean, that makes a huge difference for them. Um, and I'm not going to go back to bagging on Jared Daigie. He was a but, solid guy, but, you know, they could certainly use an upgrade. But, but they had – they were close in games last year. Some of the games they lost mm -hmm. were close with a guy who's in av who's average. You know, like – and – uh, so if they've got a guy who's above average, you know, that, that could be worth another win or two. But again, they're still, I mean, because they've been absolutely decimated by the transfer portal, I think there's just, there's some depth issues on that roster that once attrition happens, because in football, nobody goes through the season undefeated or, un, 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 or uninjured. Nobody goes under uninjured. And it's going to happen. And the teams that have the better depth or the more, usable depth of the ones you make it through and that's probably what's going to get them i think that's like what i said earlier about texas that's probably what's going to get texas ultimately is not necessarily the talent that's that's on the roster and playing but when that talent gets hurt you know do they have the 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 real depth that the teams that win the conference have you you look at west virginia that's, that's a great question paul and really for everybody i mean you can have but uh, Pittsburgh is their opening game. We know that they're renewing that rivalry, and that's a, a, that's a great thing to do. Uh, then Kansas, a, a, a conference game on September the 9th. Townsend, then Virginia Tech on the road, and then they start the rest of the way, including Baylor on uh, October 12th, the week after they, uh, two weeks after they played Texas to close out uh, the game against Texas at the end of September. Chad Morris, he's been around. He's that's not an easy coach. schedule. That's uh, that's no. very well could be two and two. They're four and zero oh, though. That'd be a great sign. Yeah, I mean Virginia Tech on the road, Kansas. I think Kansas again. That that's going to kind of set the tone for one of those two teams that are trying to uh, get to another level. And then of course at Pittsburgh, off the top, will be tough, even with the changes they've had in their program. Yeah, t Kansas though, their numbers are just so bad. Like that's the that's the thing. I think they'll be a, a little shade better uh, this year, but man, they just do not have. The, the depth. Uh, well, I mean, but talk that's about early enough to where it may not. No, I know. Yeah. I'm just saying, like you know, my what I'm trying to get to is that I think Kansas is going to be better. I don't think that's a team that you can just you know scratch off and go, oh, that's a win, and not even feel like you have to prepare for it. I think you know they're going to be tough for teams, not you know maybe for all four quarters, but I think they're going to be well coached and they'll give you you know a little bit of a pain if you don't take them seriously and you think that that's just a, a game you can slough off. Uh, and I think we've seen Texas learn that. I'm not trying to poke at them, but we've seen them learn that lesson a couple of times now. So, yeah, you, you get them early in the season and don't know quite what to expect. Everybody's pretty much healthy. Um, yeah, that's, that's a game you can't just automatically assume you're going to win, but they should win that game. Like, they should still win that game. But, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting, you know, outside of Towson, that's a – a very interesting first month of the season for them. And, and however they get out of that one, that could really, yeah, set the table for a big bounce back year or, you know, a year where there's a lot more calls for Neil Brown and, and a little bit of a change at the top. So that, that'll be a, a very interesting opening month for them. Owen said Geogra uh, geography certainly does factor in West Virginia, has traveled on Thursday for an easy away, for an away game to get a conference game on Friday. No, he's talking about expansion. Uh, I think he was talking, Jed was talking about was the geography when it comes to the conference itself, the way it's put together. I, I have one story about Chad. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Chad Morris, uh, I've known him he, since he was a high school football athlete, coached in East Texas two, two, three hours from here on the east of Waco. You know, he's been in the college, Clemson, head mm. coach at SMU. He's at Arkansas, right? And mm -hmm. uh, his son, Chandler, of course, just crushed, beat up Baylor defensively in a game that was one of their two losses up in Fort Worth. He uh, took over the job at the largest high school football or high school in Texas, at Allen High School, uh, absolute, Kyler Murray, et cetera. He resigned today as the head coach. He was there for one year. They were 11-3, and three, which at Allen is like if Alabama loses more than a game or a game, right? I mean, seriously, it's uh, – it's, and the competition is great in the state of Texas, especially the DFW area. 
So that's interesting. I know him very well. I have not said anything to him. I have not texted him. I was going to do that in the break. And, uh, uh, Craig, you said you saw a note about the fact that he might be looking at an opportunity back in the college game. That's what the Dallas Morning News said. They had a headline about him having some opportunity in college. Um, you know, and obviously, as you outlined, he's had a lot of experience there. But um, let's see here. Uh, it's got his quotes, uh, and he hasn't apparently been on the record, but uh, that was their headline, and I know how headlines can be really sketchy, so I was looking for you know what that refers to. But from the Dallas Morning News, Allen football coach Chad Morris steps down, has opportunity, to, has opportunity to return to college football, but I don't see where that return is supposed to be coming, so I guess we'll see on that. In the premium section, I can share this. Sometimes there's some stories that are up for the premium section only, and eventually we, we might have them, and then it's in the premium section, but... Uh, those who have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, Sikkim365 YouTube, uh, Colt saying, please do that very quickly. All you have to do is log into your Gmail account and click the link he has put inside of the premium section. It says, I need 280 of you to get to a certain number that he's trying to get to. He even has the link for you to subscribe if you have not yet done so. Needed 280. We're just above 200. I was going to mention that earlier. We're an hour and a half into the show. So if you have not subscribed and you want to go to that link in the Sikkim 365 premium section, I'm going to ask Colt if I could actually put the link up on Twitter or even in the chat room. Maybe we can or not. To be clear, it is not this channel that everyone is watching right now. It is the Baylor Sikkim 365 YouTube channel. Oh, okay, okay. So it's a separate one. Well, that's okay. You can still do it with uh, with what we do here if you want to go to that channel. So yes, Jack, please subscribe. Just yeah. wanted to be clear. One other note. Brittany Griner, former Baylor great, her detention has been extended another month. And this is, uh, just hearing about it, it sounds like a, I, I don't think there's any good news to it. I guess the good news would be that, you know, her trial is coming up so people would know or she'll have an idea of what Rush is going to do. But it, I think this has complicated things a little bit for the U.S. And there's rumors of a discussed prisoner swap of a Russian who's in U.S. and all that. But these things are so complicated. And I think the bad news about this is this this means now this is on the, you know, the higher Russian government's radar is something that matters to Americans. She appeared uh, a brief hearing handcuffed, her dreadlocks covered in a red hoodie, and her face held low. And uh, one of the, uh, I guess, uh, who is it? The attorney, Russian attorney making the comment, uh, we did not receive any complaints about the detention conditions from our client. So um, she's you can always been believe in detention anything. for three months and now it's another month. You can always believe lawyers, especially Russian lawyers. You know, <laughs> they never lie about anything. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't trust anybody over there. Um, just like they don't trust anybody over here. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the deal is uh, with, with Brittany. And, and, you know, but I certainly do feel like, yeah, now this has started to garner the type of attention that it probably doesn't need. I mean, it, it does and in, in, from the standpoint of awareness that she's out there and we can't forget about her. But the more attention that's paid to it, it's kind of like a, yep. you know, double-edged sword because they suddenly are like, oh, wow, you all seem really bothered by this. Hmm. And their first response isn't to help out. Uh, their first response is to, oh, we probably should probably keep her longer Let's then. take advantage of yeah, it. Yeah, so, I mean, damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, you don't talk about it, you forget about her, and she just wastes away in a prison cell. You do talk about it, and they love the attention and love the fact that they've got that to hold over you. And so, she wastes away in a prison cell. And she I wastes mean, away in a prison cell. And yeah, the it just sucks, man. the season for is about two weeks in. And that's the whatever. least yeah. of any concerns is her playing basketball. Uh, Jack McKenzie, uh, not ne I guess next segment, the area code 901, I sent you a note about the uh, uh, scholarships and all that. I don't know if you put that one up. We're going to have that. It's an interesting note from a, a area code 901. When it comes to that 48-hour window uh, that was being mentioned earlier this week when it comes to commitments, offers, commitments, 48-hour window, and we like to think of football, men's basketball, it's got a great point about the history of a lot of sports that aren't the ones that are the major sports, the revenue sports. And really, that's kind of like what the street rules are. We'll have that for you as well. Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Ideal MRI. In the Central Texas Marketplace, just off of I-35 in the southern part of Waco. Great facility. I've been in it, I think it's at least three times, maybe four. 
I've been there for an appointment at 10 o'clock in the morning. I've been there for an appointment at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And I've also been able to get there for an appointment where they waited for me after this show ended. And I drove to the southern part of Waco. It's not that long of a drive, but maybe 15 to 25 minutes to get an MRI. I've had one on my left shoulder. I've had one on my abdomen. And you never know when you might have something that hurts so much. And your doctor orthopedic doctor or whoever it might be orthopedic surgeon or doctor said hey we need to get an mri you tell them and they probably will make that recommendation as well or they should to get the mri at ideal mri in the central texas marketplace on average an mri is eleven hundred dollars theirs is four hundred and ninety seven dollars top high level that's it that's the that's the ceiling every time and maybe less They'll help you with insurance. They'll find out what hurts you so much that you can't sleep or function or walk or do something. It is IdealMRI.com. At Allen Samuels in Waco, we're committed to taking care of our customers, and that means having as much new inventory on hand for you to choose from. During the Memorial Day sales event, shop for a large selection of 2022 cars, trucks, and SUVs to find the vehicle that's right for you. Need maintenance or repair? Let our skilled technicians take care of your vehicle, and we'll get you back on the road safer than before. We're not here just to sell you one car. We're here for the long haul. Allen Samuels in Waco. Come by. Let's be friends. How did Edward Jones become one of the biggest financial service companies in the world? By not acting that way. Financial strategies, one-on-one advice, it's a big difference. And that's why Brad Wilson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, makes sense of investing. Experience the difference for yourself. Brad Wilson, 250 Sharon Drive in Woodway, 254-776-4337. Edward Jones, member SIPC. From the first workout to the last practice, sports is an incredible challenge. Hi, this is Dan Engel with the First National Bank of Central Texas, and we're proud to support each athlete, every parent, and our educators. From families, small businesses, to the biggest industry, we're here to help. With remarkable products like instant issue debit cards free at all of our banking centers, we've got banking ideas that fuel big dreams. The First National Bank of Central Texas, familiar faces making local decisions. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. Shorty's Pizza Shack at 12th and Bagby is a homegrown, family-owned and operated must-visit pizza place in Waco. Fantastic pizza by the slice or get the whole pie to share. Great happy hour specials every single day. And it's not just pizza. Great wings. You have to try the Sikkim sauce, chili cheese fries, pizza pillows, and more. Dine in for a great hangout or carryout. Order online at shortyspizzashack.com or do yourself a favor and bring your crew to the restaurant at 12th and Bagby. Shorty's Pizza Shack. Tell them Paul sent you by. Brad Boozer, Boozer Jeweler, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio. This is it's a great time for your business. Exactly. And, and one other thing we do that, that a lot of people don't know is we buy jewelry, heirloom pieces, gold, silver, silver bars, gold bullion, watches, anything you may have that you want to, if, if you don't want to use it and remake something like I did in a state yesterday and I looked at 35 pieces, well, they're probably going to sell me back 30 because it's something they're not going to wear and nothing to use. So if you're looking to get a few bucks or to sell something or something you just don't wear anymore. I make my wife go through her jewelry box about every six to eight months and the things that she doesn't wear on a daily basis, this sounds horrible, but I take away from her <laughs> and then and then I'll put in my estate counter, but then that gives me the chance to rebuy her something new moving forward instead of looking down 20 years down the road and you have 300 pieces of jewelry. It's something to refresh and make her buy something new along the way. You want to know why they're successful? Brad Boozer, the owner of Boozer's Jewelers on the corner of Valley Mills and Lake Air in Waco. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, Lake Shore Drive and North 19th Street, right behind the bank, is a hidden gem in Waco. If you're a fan of bourbon, especially local Texas bourbons, that's where you gotta go. Balcones, TX, Devil's River, whatever it is, they've got it. Riverbend Liquor and Wine, plus the best selection of craft beers in Waco, seasonally churned out throughout the year. Whether it's spring, summer, fall, or winter, Riverbend Liquor and Wine, best selection of craft beers, a speedy drive through window, an excellent and customer service. Find out more on Instagram or just go by and see them. Lakeshore Drive and North 19th Street behind the bank. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Are you a Sikkim 365 super fan? 
Then try out our premium subscriptions at Sikkim365.com. All right, we have some amazing viewers, listeners, whether it's the app, online, YouTube, solar system, whatever you do, we appreciate it. And I, I promise you, when there's a text, a text line, and sometimes they come in in the evening, so a lot of you during the, the show. But this is interesting because there's a lot of times we can learn from you and hopefully vice versa. The area code 901, remember we brought up that 48-hour limit of uh, you get a you, you, you offer a player, he has 48 hours, and it was I don't know if it was Mike Bray or it might have been Joe Moglia. It's Joe Moglia. He right. said, offer 48 hours, commit, sign. No matter when it is, August 15th or July 7th. The area code 901, because we're thinking football mainly in men's basketball. I wanted to weigh in on the 48-hour time limit proposal. In lesser or zero revenue sports, that is basically the street rules. I'm a huge lacrosse fan. And for Division I caliber players that are not top 15, they are essentially forced to commit within 48 hours or shorter. Out east and up north, there are hundreds of players that are Division I caliber each year. Sorry for the misspelling there. It's my fault. But only 78 Division I men's teams. Teams resort to offering scholarships to 7th and 8th graders. I think that even happens. Seems like women's basketball might be. I, I know that's her. And saying commit now or offer is gone. Go to the bold part. This causes several quality players to go to Division Three schools. I just don't want college football, obviously, too much of a lesser, to a, obviously to a much lesser degree, offering scholarships to players too young to be truly be evaluated. Yeah, Alabama offered Dylan Moses, and I think others did when he was in, like, seventh grade. Uh, so that football's not, you know, immune to doing something similar in terms of uh, offering young players. Uh, I remember that very well from from his time going, what the it hell? We're talking Mustaine, about Mustaine, he got, like, offers. Probably, yeah. yeah. That whole Springfield, or what was it, the the Springfield Five or something like that yeah. that they call those Arkansas kids. Yeah, that didn't that didn't quite pan out the way that it was expected to. But yeah, uh, he he probably did. Um, that that seems to ring a bell. But yeah, I, I remember Dylan Moses in particular. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's very interesting. I just think uh, going back to since that's kind of commenting on Joe Moglia's comment. I think uh, then you have to go back to what Joe Moglia said. And while that may be the case in lacrosse, football is an entirely different breed. It's an entirely different sport with entirely different rules in terms of where it sits in the college sports pecking order. And as he said, and I agree with him, you got to stop looking at it from a thousand foot view of like everybody's equal. Lacrosse is not equal to football. It's just not. So they need to figure out on a almost case by case basis, I think, how they want to do this because the rules for football are not going to fly the rules with lacrosse. You know what I mean? So that might that might work for lacrosse, even though it doesn't sound like it's the best method either. Like it sounds like lacrosse kind of needs to figure some things out. But yeah, I don't think you can you just look at all sports and look at them as though they're all the same thing. I think you got to, especially with football, you need to take it as its own separate deal, basketball as well. And then maybe, you know, with the Olympic sports, other sports, you kind of have a blanket model perhaps um but that's that's interesting insight i didn't know that about lacrosse and obviously you know there's not a lot of lacrosse teams around here so it's not something that we we typically you know talk about or even notice all that much but yeah that's food for thought i just think that like i said football is, is a little bit of a different beast have you any of you in this room ever played jack you're from wisconsin have you ever played lacrosse nope Emory? i would have i the sports that I would have actually loved to have played, I didn't get the chance to play because they didn't have them. Uh, we only had football, basketball, baseball, whatever. And the two sports that I really – actually, the three sports that I really would have loved to have tried would have been hockey, lacrosse, and wrestling. And they didn't have any of that. But So, you know, just well, – um, I did. We, we, didn't have, we didn't have wrestling in my high school, and we lost – um, one of our best football players because of that. And actually, uh, his name's Seth Petroselli. He beat Kimbo Slice in a, a UFC fight. R.I.P. Uh, Kimbo. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Seth, Seth Petroselli, uh, we lost him to another school because we didn't have wrestling at my school. We And they have lacrosse now, which would have been great when I was uh, in high school. I'm but telling you right now, if I would have had it throughout my high school career, I wanted to play baseball all my life, and I'm pretty decent at it, but never again. I saw a real curveball peed on my leg. Lacrosse in Japan, when we were at Yokota High School or Chofu High School, they had it. They had wrestling as well. I love that sport. You got to have a little bit between your neck, not that I do, 
But, I mean, it's a tough sport. Emory, you did play it, huh? In high school? No, it was uh, middle school to freshman year. Okay, sorry about that. This is Emory Winter with three headsets on. You, where were you at? Uh, I was in Oklahoma City. So my school didn't have it. Um, so we had to go to, like, the suburb right outside of Oklahoma City, the Edmond Lacrosse League. So it's a great sport. Cardio, yeah. physicality, toughness. I love it. It's the best part of the American Pie movie. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would have loved to have played it, but they didn't, didn't have it, have anything close to it. I don't even think there was any club deals or no. whatever on East Texas, so that didn't, didn't stand a chance. But, yeah, that and, and hockey in particular, the wrestling – that would have been fun just because of my interest in that. But I also know, like, the weight cutting and all that crap that comes with it probably would have been old real, real fast. But hockey and lacrosse, I would have enjoyed that. I, probably, I might have chosen those over playing baseball and basketball for sure. I yeah. think I think of, when I think of hop, uh, uh, lacrosse, I know Duke, North Carolina, I think of Johns Hopkins. Yeah. That's the first school I think about. I don't know if they're still the, the it, but uh, that's what I always think about. The way I think about it now going back, us not having wrestling probably cost us our senior year when – uh, Seth would have been, you know, a senior with me, uh, probably cost us two or three wins in football because he was just that good of an athlete. Stop. <laughs> no, I'm serious. He was a defensive lineman with a crazy streak in him uh, that you just don't have. I mean, yeah. So yeah, I, I think about that. I think about that quite a bit. All right. Well, Virginia's the defending champion. They've won two of the last three. The one year was canceled. Just a thought about lacrosse. I love mm -hmm. – it's been a while for Johns Hopkins, but they ran it. Virginia's really good. Syracuse, of course, as well, and Duke. All right, so that's what's going on now. That's the 901 text. Now, here is another one of our listeners. We have three guests in the 5 o'clock hour, and we will jump in with uh, different type college programs that we're going to hit in the 5 o'clock hour, including Florida – USC and then LSU, our great friend Mike Scarborough. What a great way to end the week with him. Here is uh, uh, from Steve Snook He's from Ohio, another one of our viewers, when he was talking about pods. Now, before you freak out when you see these logos, this is just kind of a scenario. Steve was saying, and again, I, hypothetical, you can like them or not, if in fact the Pac-12, which they will not break up, but if in fact the Pac-12 ever had any issues with their media rights, which is up, you know, they got to be doing that pretty soon. He thought, okay, how about this? You gain Arizona and Arizona State in Utah, and then he put the USF Bulls in here, which is kind of a quirky name to put in this list. But here's how he was putting the pods together. We're not done. You were talking about pods. We were talking about pods. So you have, you can barely see Cincinnati's logo, but those are the four pods. And he just kind of, this is what his thoughts were and how they might make sense. I like that one at the bottom. That just looks cool because Look, of the logos. I, Arizona, I, ASU, Brigham Young, and also Utah. Uh, I got to say, just as a general, uh, if that's a 16-team conference, that conference I would enjoy. I would, I would like I would that too. conference. I know, and so that's that's how he put up the pods. Jack, is there another? Yeah, here's another one. After uh, Okay, nine-game conference schedules. Three in pod two, uh, three in your pod. Two from each other pod, example, schedule over two years. He put that up there. And then off to the right, just for the purposes of TV market size, the combination of maybe the, the different market size. And, of Good course, Lord. some are much, much better. Is Lubbock really that low? I didn't realize that. 146 uh, versus Waco's, where's Waco at? 83. 83. 83. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought that they'd been that low in comparison. That's Let me tell you something. This is what we have with you who watch us. Whatever your favorite program is. we they, uh, Thank you. We have the Tony Altamars who sends us this stuff. We have Steven hey, Snook who sends can, us can this stuff. Can you put the TV, the, market, one. the TV yeah. market one back up there again? Does he have Kansas City? Yeah, Kansas City's. Kansas okay. City's. Yeah. yeah, okay. So that, sure. this is yeah. just, this is Steve. He put this together, and Jack did a great job making it into the graphic. So if you, this is, again, if the, this is four teams. I know some of you are going to lose your mind because you don't see Boise, or you don't see Memphis, or you don't see SMU, or you don't, whoever. Well, I mean, it's if. Just, again, <laughs> oh, if the, those three right there, they trump anybody I mentioned. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. So I thank you very much to see Stephen, uh, Steve Snook, and hope that your dad's doing okay as well. Mike and Steve with their fathers have been struggling a little bit. Thank you very much. Um, he, he, from Tony, um, not to criticize the graphics, the Arizona Board of Regents, at least for now, they do not seem terribly interested in any kind of a move. And that's from Tony, who's kind of got the pulse for us 
out on the West Coast as well. That's why I'm saying if, in fact, hypothetical, I love what Steven put together just for the just for the kicks. Yeah, and uh, outside of basketball, neither seem really, uh, you know, in tune with competing at high level right now <laughs> as far as Arizona basketball is, you know, good. But uh, the football programs at the moment are uh, – Whew, not not uh, not doing well, but yeah, I mean those. If you could somehow pull Pac-12 schools, which we know is a long shot at this point, yeah, that would be. I'm sorry, Boise and and whoever else wants to line up. You are not trumping Arizona schools or Utah to get into the league. That's just that's just common sense. Um, but yeah, if you can't get those schools one day, uh, which is again a very long shot. Because uh, the Pac-12 is not going to, you know, just let them walk free at any point. Nor will they, you know, maybe have the people in charge who would want to leave anyways. They like the, the, you know, the West Conference, Western Coast uh, alliance, so to speak. But, uh, yeah, if you could, that would be the dream scenario. And that looks like a really great league where all the geography makes a lot more sense. And it's not, it's spread out, but it's spread out in a good kind of way where there's at least, you know, those pods that are all relatively close together. Like, that looks like a legit conference. And I'm not the biggest on USF necessarily, but they would make sense in that scenario if you could add those other Arizona schools in Utah. Yeah, that would make a ton of sense and would be great, but... And the East and the West Coast, like the Central Time Zone schools, are, are pretty much fine either way because you're, you know, you're not going to lose as much time going East or West because we're in the middle. But uh, the East and West schools not having to play each other and have those, you know, having more games where you could do that in other sports, especially. Yeah, no, you're right, and and then also for the three, two, one. All I can say is after this round, don't water down the Big Twelve with more G5s. And again. We, we, we don't know what's going to happen next, but I love the feedback. Steven Snook, he goes, how about this as a total surprise? He's the one that pe- put those graphics together. On the same day with Dr. Miyakawa, just so everyone knows our comparative IQs are light years apart with his graphics compared to Dr. Miyakawa, who joined us uh, well, earlier as well. We appreciate that. Uh, you know, those those graphics look great, and it's, you know, interesting to, to look at and, and, you know, food for thought, but... You know, they are currently in the Pac-12 and uh, will be, you know, for the foreseeable future. But if, you know, all hell were to break loose, which is entirely possible in college athletics these days, you never quite know. And we'll know. I mean, we're we're going to know in the next couple of years. We're going to start seeing TV deals signed, and, and that's going to make the, the future a lot clearer. But um, I don't think anybody has a great grasp. And if you were to sit there and, you know, gun to your head, you want to put up your, your year's salary – to predict what's going to happen in five years. I don't think anybody would feel confident enough to do that um, because it's just, there's too much uncertainty and um, you know, we don't know where everybody's going to be sitting in, in the next couple of years, but that would be, yeah, that would be one hell of a scenario and would be awesome. And I think the big 12 would, would thrive with that, that setup. but you know, it's going to take a few things to pull that off. One more quote and we got a break. We do. Tony said the one thing that Danny white, the AD at Arizona state, one of the best things that ever happened to ASU was being strong armed to join the Pac-12, uh, Arizona and Arizona State. So that doesn't look like it's going to happen, but it, I love just the the thought of it as well. All right, when we come back, we go rapid fire, three different college programs that we're about to be a part of this show. Edgar Thompson on Florida with Billy Napier, Ryan Abraham on USC, Lincoln Riley, and also the visit of Jordan Addison, and Mike Scarborough, our great friend down in Baton Rouge on LSU. Paul's top five in an hour, sick him. 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Dr. Kent Petty can help you feel better. All right, that hopefully, you know, why? Well, as you get older, testosterone levels in your body can drop, and they do for one out of every three men. Maybe you're the two out of three, so you don't worry about it. Maybe that comes down the road or never at all. Good for that. I hope that doesn't happen. But if you're one out of every three men who have symptomatic issues of low testosterone, well, Listen to me. Dr. Kent Petty can help you become the high-performance man that you want to be, need to be, and used to be. I say this a lot. Low testosterone can affect your energy, can affect your focus, can affect your sleep habits, can affect your sex drive. It can also affect your weight gain. It can do that too. Dr. Kent Petty can help you. Get online. PettyClinicLowT.com. Tell him I sent you. There's an email and phone number. Tell him Smokey sent you. He will set you up to get your blood drawn, to get your lab results. He'll look at them, and if your testosterone level is too low, he can put you in a program to increase it and get all or some of that back that you're missing right now. One out of every three men have symptomatic issues of low testosterone. Maybe you are that one, and if you're fortunate, you're the other two. PettyClinicLowT.com.
Cars price right both day and night. Average your car in Texas. Trucks built for you, red, white, and blue. Average your car in Texas. Cars that zoom with lots of room. Average your car in Texas. Count on us, a dealer to trust. Average your car in Waco, Texas. Texas Farm Bureau Insurance has protected fellow Texans with auto, home, health, and life insurance since 1952. With more than 260,000 square miles of land and 27 million people, that's a lot to cover. Whether you're wrangling cattle or wrangling kids, we're proud to protect Texans in all Texan ways of life. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. Stepping into a new pair of boots is great, but stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can also add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. There are more than 150 occupational specialties to help them find the best fit for their future. See all the things your son or daughter can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. At Ideal MRI, we feel blessed to be part of the Waco community. We're a small family business here in Central Texas. At times like this, the cost of health care has never been more important. And unfortunately, significant illnesses and injuries still occur. And that's why Ideal MRI is open and here to serve you through this difficult time. So if you need an MRI, ask your doctor about Ideal MRI. You can schedule online in minutes at IdealMRI.com or call 833-IDEAL-MRI. It's plain and simple. Waco Custom Marketplace is the one-stop shop for what you need for tailgating from charcoal, cold beer, and wine. And, of course, customize your order with brisket, tri-tips, sausage, wings, smoked pork tenderloin, country-style or pork spare ribs, marinated beef and chicken fajita meat, ground beef and chili, meat, hot dogs, and burgers, buns, seasoning, sauces, chips. There's fresh-baked bread and kolaches every day, breakfast sausage links, and you can also customize your favorite Favorite cut of steaks from select choice or prime, bacon wrap, fillets, ribeyes, New York strips, sirloin, T-bone, and porterhouse. Full service butcher shop includes pork, poultry, beef, chicken, and seafood. Serving Waco restaurants and families since 1940. Your one-stop shop for beef, pork, poultry, and seafood needs. Waco Custom Marketplace, 425 Lake Air Drive, or WacoCustomMarketplace.com. Automatic Chef Canteen is a full-service micro-market vending and office coffee provider with state-of-the-art vending equipment, a wide variety of products, and offering custom-fitted micro-market vending office coffee solutions for your employee break room. You want a full break room solution and a workplace oasis? Well, Automatic Chef Canteen, locally owned and operated for over 50 years in Central Texas, also includes in-house mechanics on call 24-7 for fast, reliable service and maintenance. Automatic Chef Canteen, 6900 Imperial Drive in Waco or online at AutomaticChefCanteen.com. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. The Sikkim 365 Radio app is sponsored by Alan Samuels Dodge Chrysler Jeep Ram Fiat in Waco. Your friend in the car business at Loop 340 and east of 84. Come by. Let's be friends. All right, here we go, this 5 o'clock hour. Paul, yesterday was a dead, last day or two, has had a, a top five that closes out every day. And one of them was uh, about teams and how they're handling and maybe the change in transition and teams that are up because of the transition in coaches, among others. And one of them was Billy Napier, of course, at Florida. Edgar Thompson, Orlando Sentinel, he's joined us before on the Gators on Sikkim 365 Radio. So, Edgar, now that you've had a chance to kind of get a sneak peek for a little bit, what's the – the barometer as far as the enthusiasm of Billy Napier among the Gators fan base? I think people are pretty enthused. He's an engaging guy. He's extremely thoughtful in his answers, if not profound on some level. Uh, You know, I'm pretty impressed with 
how he like digs into a question and, and you almost read it later, like your transcription of it, man. And you're like, man, that's some pretty deep stuff. And he is very, very, I believe not window dressing that he is concerned about the entire kind of player. Like he talks about the holistic approach. He wants these players to get like something out of this four or five years or in college. Um, whether it's a degree, a new perspective on life, their eyes open on some level. Cause he looks at the right, he knows that 10 of these guys might play in the NFL if they're lucky, right? So he looks at it in a cool way, I think. And I think fans like that. But at the same time, they want to see more top players coming to Florida. They're hand wringing about his lack of impact in the transfer portal thus far after basically talking about being very aggressive there. Um, the recruiting for 2023 is paramount. They need to land a monster class in 2023. So there's a lot of focus on that because there are questions and holes all over this roster because of some of the neglect of the previous regime on the recruiting trail. I mean, Dan Mullen was a wonderful play caller, developer, and very astute football mind, but that organizational piece and the recruiting piece he kind of lost sight of somewhere along the way. And this is why Billy Napier is here. Edgar, uh, we, we have a little bit of that, not in a little bit of it. It sounds like you're describing uh, how Dave Aranda uh, approaches things uh, here at Baylor. He's kind of the same way about the, the holistic approach, the, the person of a player is, is kind of the, the mantra there. But for Billy Napier on the recruiting trail, I mean, it's pretty impressive. The, the, at least the guys he's got putting Florida on their list right now, that wasn't happening for the last two years, isn't it? I definitely think that he's getting in roads with some players and of uh, a different elk, let's say. One thing he's done that you guys seen over in Texas, and you probably aren't quite as aware of the IMG Academy in Bradenton. It's a yeah. football factory. Oh, yeah. It's a sports factory. It's like what Nick Volatari made his name, developing all these tennis greats with Andre Agassi and Celis and all these people. And now it's this big football factory. And the Gators didn't get anyone out of that under Dan Mullen, anyone out of that place. And Billy already got a, a borderline five-star safety, Kamari Wilson, who Georgia was, was after. And he just signed a lineman out of there, about a 300 prospect. So he made inroads already there, and that could be significant down the road. They definitely are in on some guys. His hiring of LSU, former LSU assistant, um, Uber defensive coach, Corey Raymond. I mean, my God, the lo list of guys that guy brought into LSU is unbelievable. I mean, Jamal Adams, uh, Derek Stingley, uh, Eli Ricks, Kristen Fulton, Tredavious White, all these guys that he lured and turned that place into really the real DBU. You know, that debate that goes on. And he's here now. They have like three five-star cornerbacks that are looking hard at Florida. And you're even hearing Arch Manning's name bandied about. Whether that's even realistic, probably not. But if you get him over here and you show him something and connect with the kid, you never know where it can lead. Edgar, on that, that quarterback front, uh, Emory Jones obviously on his way out. So kind of a two-part question here. One, uh, just your thoughts on Emory Jones heading to Arizona State. And, and what is Jack Miller, uh, what kind of an impression has he made so far? Emory needed a change of scenery. Things just didn't work out, shockingly, really. I mean, Dan had groomed this kid for years. Do you realize they were recruiting Dan? They were recruiting Emory Jones. He was nursing a foot injury or he had some surgery or something. And he drove with his mother to Starkville from LaGrange, which is southwest of Atlanta, about 60 miles. And Brian Johnson, now with the Eagles, sport coach and quarterback, uh, Dan Mullen and Dak Prescott were in the room. That's how long ago this is. 2015. <laughs> he was with Emory for years. And then Emory gets here in 2017 early in Roll Lee. People even thought he was going to push for the job then as a 17-year-old. He waited and waited and waited his turn. And Felipe gets hurt and Trask takes over. And the rest is history there. Record set in season in 2020. Heisman finalist. Emory, then he finally gets his chance, guys. And we're like, yes, let's see it. And it was a dud. 
and he had a lot of interceptions. He tied for the SEC lead with 13. His final QB rating in the bowl game was 37-2. It was brutal, terrible performance. Yet he stuck around, and you're like, okay, he's going to give Anthony some competition, Anthony Richardson, and going to potentially be like, you know, a backup again. And then he lasted like three spring practices and was in the portal. So now it's Anthony Richardson's show. And he showed well during the spring game. The kid has transcendent athletic ability. Can he be a transcendent quarterback? They're going to need him to be. Jack Miller is his backup. He came from Ohio State, transfer. He's an Arizona kid who came out with some some stripes for sure. You don't end up at Ohio State without that. And he fell in the he, – you know, he lost ground to C.J. Stroud and never really got on the field. He didn't look very good in the spring game. He was okay. I think he had a pretty solid spring. He's certainly capable of probably being a very solid backup. But this is going to be Anthony Richardson's show. He's going to have to stay healthy. He's going to have to prove he can improve as a decision maker. The young man turned 20 this month, so he's very young. He's a physical specimen, 6'4", like 237. He can do backflips. He's got wide receiver speed, a gun for an arm. How accurate he is is going to be important. He can run. He can do it all. I mean, people are making Cam Newton comparisons and stuff. Let's let's tap the brakes here a little. But the kid is – he if he's the truth, the Gators have a chance to have a solid season. I mean, they got a lot of questions otherwise. But if they can solve that piece, that's a good start. What are some of those questions? I mean, they're, they don't have maybe some of the skill guys that they used to have, and I know that along the fronts they're not knocking around as they used to back in the day. Yeah, I mean, the skill players has been off and on an issue for a while. I mean, Musk Camp rarely was getting guys. Um, McElwain did bring a couple guys in that Mullen took and developed, like a Freddie Swain, for example. Kadarius Tony really became a star under Mullen. He was a McElwain recruit. Paul Pitt, obviously, is going to, it was a legend at Florida. I mean, our, you know, he's amazing. Uh, and he was a fourth pick in the draft last year as a tight end. So they don't have a guy like any of those dudes. Antonio, Antonio Callaway, his freshman season was pretty much of a star. I mean, he was an explosive game changer. I don't know who the game changer is on the perimeter for them. I don't know if they have one. They seem to have an issue with getting open in terms of just, like, the explosiveness. You've got to be able to separate to give your quarterback a chance. And in the SEC, man, you are facing NFL-level talent at cornerback almost every week. So it's a big ask. So they, they need Justin Shorter, Xavier Henderson, Trent Whittemore in the slot's pretty nice. Um, Deshaun Reynolds is a kid who's kind of come out of nowhere, a slot guy. I don't know who's going to emerge there. And they need a couple, too. Um, and they don't have tight end depth at all either. So there's questions in the passing game, but the running back room is stopped. They, they have two five star recruits. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I didn't mean to do that. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say it's stocked. They have two five stars Lorenzo uh, Lengard, a Miami transfer. He's an Orlando, an Orlando area kid. And De- Demarcus Bowman of Lakeland, he was at Clemson and came here. Neither's done anything. I don't know whether it's because of pass protection not learning the offense. These coaches, they're fickle when it comes to playing a kid at running back because if you're going to get the quarterback killed or you don't, you right, they don't let you play or you don't know the what hole to go. I mean, you don't know where you're going. I mean, that's a big part of being a running back. <laughs> so those kids haven't played yet. Why, I don't know, but they're going to get a chance, you think. But the one that's intriguing is Montreal Johnson, the Louisiana transfer, had a really nice first year there at Louisiana. He looked pretty good this spring or very good. And then you have Naquan Wright, who's a senior, and he's shown some some signs, you know, some bursts and pass catching ability and things. So it's going to be interesting as to how they deploy those guys. But as as uh, you guys said a second ago, the line, you know, it's a line of scrimmage league, as Will Muschamp like like to say. And their offensive line has been an issue for years now. It looks like it's trending a bit. They have some veteran guys. They have some. You, they have some potential, but the depth is a big, big question. And depth-wise on the defensive line, they have none. They have a few good pieces, Javon Dexter, Brenton Cox, some guys like that, but there's no depth there, and that's a real concern. 
Edgar, uh, what's been kind of Billy Napier's approach or, or thoughts about the, the transfer portal in the NIL era? How has he sort of navigated that, and, and what's been sort of his stance uh, in that regard? I think he's probably, since it started, he's probably already changed his view on it twice, because that's <laughs> what it's like. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's a moving target. It's overwhelming as a journalist. I've been off for a couple weeks. I get back to the fire next week. I don't even know where to start writing about NIL. Mm-hmm. It's like, what's the story? Where? What isn't the story? It's like it's endless amounts of, it's constantly changing. No one knows. People want to build war chests. That's the big thing. Billy Napier apparently needs, he believes he needs a $20 million war chest annually. We're not just talking like we need $20 million so we can start doing this the right way. We need that every year. That is not what the intention of this rule was. This was not, or this legislation. Last week, the gymnastics team that finished second in the nation signed an NIL deal with this campus, uh, campus hunks. It's a moving company. And these young women are vivacious. They're four of students. They're tremendous athletes. They're photogenic. They're everything you'd want. They're just getting in the game 10 months into it because it's become a recruiting tool for the revenue sport. It wasn't supposed to be that. It was supposed to be, hey, this kid has a social media following. Their personal- they got personality. They got this. It wasn't supposed to be so you could give some high school kid a six-figure deal so he would come to your school. But that's, of course, what it's become. Everyone kind of suspected that and they were kind of naive not to get out in front of this a little bit but here that's where we are right now and now they're trying to put the genie back in the bottle i don't know how they're going to do it edgar uh, how do you feel the uh florida football well the state of florida college football renaissance is going with mike norvell now heading into his third season and mario cristobal and, and billy napier in their first seasons trying to get the big three back to even just some sort of, hey, that might be a good game to watch, relevance. Uh, I think, you know, Mario Cristobal was a great hire, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, He's a Miami guy. He played for the U back in the day. He and Leon Cerci were bookends on a national championship team, I believe, if not two. And this guy is, uh, he's going to be a problem. And... (laughs) He's putting together a good staff. I mean, you got Josh Gaddis, you know, the recent Rolls Award-winning OC from Michigan. Um, Greg Schiano, maybe, I think. Uh, no, no, Schiano's not there. I'm trying to think. He's got somebody else. It, it doesn't matter. Their staff is coming together, and it's impressive, and he can recruit, and he's in the most fertile recruiting ground maybe in the country down there for skill talent at least. He's got Ed Reed on his staff, I believe. So he's going to be a problem. Mike Norvell, year three, needs to start doing something. He's an impressive guy. I don't know what their talent's like. I don't have my finger on the pulse of that program very well. Um, it's a wait-and-see deal there. Uh, and Billy, obviously, is. Look, the Gators' schedule is brutal, guys. They open with Utah, Pac-10, Pac-12 defending champions, and good, good program with continuity. Kyle Wittenham has been there since Urban left there in 2004. I mean, that's how long he's been around. And he was with Urban prior to that. And then you get Kentucky coming in. Now, I think Kentucky might take a little step back in some ways, maybe up front. But they're a physical football team and a well-coached football team. And if they have a little skill going, they can give the Gators a good game. And then two weeks later, at Tennessee. That's a tough September start for a guy in his first year with a quarterback who started one game, and that was the Georgia game. It was a debacle for the kid, Anthony Richardson. And a lot of question marks. And then they have a three-game stretch, guys. They play LSU. Then they get a week off. They got Georgia, then at A&M. And then Missouri's thrown in there. You got South Carolina. I mean, these are tough games, man. That's eight legit games right there. So that's what fans want to see. That's what we want to see as media. I don't know if Billy Napier is, like, excited about looking at that schedule because he needs some wins and needs some traction. Hey, Edgar, great stuff as always, man. Appreciate you so much. Uh, Love how you cover the Gators and also the insight for today. Appreciate it. Edgar Thompson, the Orlando Sentinel. Utah to open up. Kentucky with what Stoops has done. That's interesting right there. And that's a a schedule because of the way the schedule. They don't have. There is no. uh, There's A&M on the other side. And Missouri. No, Missouri's in the east. LSU from the other side. 
But no Alabama. They did not have the Alabama, but they do have Georgia, of course, in the same division. You know how much I enjoy Edgar? I enjoy uh, talking about the Gators. Yeah. I mean, I, that's, I, that's, that's how good he is. When we come back, he's really good, too. Ryan Abraham covers USC as good as anybody can. And he's next on what's the thought about Jordan Addison in uh, Southern Cal, Lincoln Riley, and more. Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Richard Carr, Buick GMC Cadillac. They've got a lot of great deals going on right now over at Richard Carr. New cars and trucks arriving weekly, so you can call the dealership or go online, check out their current inventory. You can also just, you know, show up to the dealership uh, to buy or build your perfect vehicle. And uh, whether you're calling, whether you're emailing, or whether you're showing up in person, if you're looking for a new car, the first thing you need to do is get signed up on their inbound vehicle list. You get signed up on that inbound inbound vehicle list, and it's basically like getting yourself in line. Uh, so, you know, one person goes in front of you, you move up a spot, so on and so forth. The quicker you get on that, the sooner you will be first in line for that new car, truck, or SUV that you are looking for. But if you're looking for a car today, uh, then consider one of their dozens of quality pre-owned cars and trucks. All of them go through a 172-point inspection, so you can drive them with peace of mind, and they will pay top dollar on your trade with dozens of lending options. Richard Carr says yes to loans when others say no. So, again, go online or come by to check out their inventory today. They've been serving Central Texas and Waco for over 23 years offering award-winning service from their Collision and Service Center. Richard Carr is a dealer you can count on for a great deal and superior service for the life of your car. For qualified buyers, you can buy a truck now, get 0% financing for 72 months on most GMC vehicles and Buick SUVs. Give them a call, show up in person, and they'll give you more details on that. But if you're looking to buy new, get in touch with them, get on that inbound vehicle list to check out their selection. If you're looking to buy pre-owned, used, well, show up and they got the vehicles ready and they will get you set up to be in a comfortable a vehicle that you can take pride in, uh, that you can be assured will have great customer service when the time comes, and you can be uh, promised that you're getting a great deal as well. Trust the good local people you can count on. 23 years in Central Texas, Richard Carr is run by Proud Wakelands and Proud Baylor Bears. Log on to richardcarr.com today. Call now or go see them now off Highway 6 at the Imperial Exit. Baylor University is where lights shine bright. So let there be light. <laughs> Let there be roommates and teammates, scholarship and championships. Let there be fresh starts and new traditions, fast friendships and lasting impacts. Let there be laughter. Let there be joy. Let there be light. Baylor University, where lights shine bright. Brad Boozer, Boozer Jeweler, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio. I've seen people walk in there. First of all, you have so much to show. With necklaces, bracelets, rings. You have the watches. You have numerous great watches as well. You really have pretty much everything, don't you, when it comes to jewelry? That's correct. Kind of a one-stop shop and all. And the fact that we have the two jewelers on staff, the repairs we can do, the fixing of your jewelry, and the remaking of any jewelry has really set us apart from anybody else. You want to know why they're successful? Brad Boozer, the owner of Boozer's Jewelers on the corner of Valley Mills and Lake Air in Waco. With so many companies and policies out there, it gets so confusing shopping for insurance, and I never know if I'm getting the policy that's right for me. Luckily, I met the team at the Nitchy Group Insurance Agency. With the Nitchy Group, you can go to one company and get access to coverage options from many insurance carriers, and you get to speak to a real person about your specific coverage needs. With the Nitchy Group, I know I'm getting the right coverage at the right price. If you need insurance, talk to the experts. Experts at the Nitsche Group at 1 800 258 8302. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine and Orthopedics, the team physicians for Baylor Athletics, diagnosing and treating all sports related injuries, including concussions. These specialists also provide orthopedic services for athletes and non athletes alike, whether it's knee or shoulder pain, hand or wrist injuries, orthopedic spine care, and even an arthritis and total joint clinic. Trust the doctors Baylor Athletics trusts. Baylor Scott and White, Southwest Sports Medicine Orthopedics, wants to get you back in the game. You want to know why Stonewood Dental is so successful? Listen to what happy customers have to say. It's pleasant. It's different than any other dentist's office. I really feel like they care. And it's not that you're here for two hours waiting on someone to take care of you. It's quick and easy, and you know, I bring my kids, and my kids love being here too. They really love the treasure box. <laughs> 
staff is really nice and accommodating, real friendly. You feel more like home. It's not sterile looking. Everybody has their own personalized rooms with decorations and decor, and they'll even have a blanket for you when it's cold. <laughs> I've recommended people to actually come here and they are patients now. I really love it here. It feels like family. Learn more stonewood-dental.com. It takes time to reach goals. It's a truth that applies to more than sports. It goes for your financial goals as well. You work hard for your money, and you deserve an investment strategy that lines up with your game plan. And Tom Albers, your Edward Jones financial advisor, can help. If your financial investments aren't putting forth the effort you desire, stop by today for a financial review. Tom Albers, 4301 Lakeshore Drive, 254-776-7605. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Corral pumps. Pressure again, and they get to him. That was Cole Maxwell. The 5 o'clock hour is sponsored by Edward Jones Investments with financial advisor Brad Wilson. Investing his time and experience back to you and your money during today's changing times. Edward Jones, making sense of investing. Now, here's David Smoke, Paul Catalina, and Craig Smoke. Owner, publisher of uscfootball.com. He's a Heisman voter at Inside Troy on Twitter. He's our go-to guy for USC. Ryan Abraham joins us on 365 Sports, Sickle 365 Radio. Ryan, how much um, interest is there uh, or you know, activity, energy, when it comes to the Jordan Addison visit to USC? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, when that name first popped up on everyone's radar a couple of weeks ago, USC, you know, needs help at a lot of different positions, not necessarily at wide receiver, but when a guy like that enters the portal, I mean, there were six first round draft picks in the NFL for the receiver spot, and Jordan Addison won the Politnikov, so he's going to uh, get a lot of attention. You know, he has uh, the childhood connection with Caleb Williams, USC's wide receiver. I mean, I'm sorry, USC's quarterback. Uh, you know, they played wide receiver quarterback back in the DMV, DC area uh, growing up. So that kind of caught a lot of people's attention. I think Lincoln Riley made some news with some of the guys he was able to land in the portal. But if you get a guy like that, like a major college football award winner, definitely gets people's attention. How has how do you see the team with transfers and what was left and all the thing happening coming together after spring? Because I, I would assume that's probably – Lincoln Riley's biggest challenge is he's got a bunch of talent that's come in for sure, but can he make it all work in year one to contend for the Pac-12 title? Yeah, I think that's the big question because he's completely remaking the roster. I mean, there's 30-something guys that are gone. He added 13 from the transfer portal before spring, and then since spring has ended, uh, four more players. He talked about adding double digits uh, after spring football, and you know, we try to keep count of the scholarships. It looked like USC had 10 open spots, so he could potentially get there. But they're just not as big of, you know, the names in the portal aren't as big as what maybe we thought during spring. I think the coaches out there across the country realize how important the portal is, and they're recruiting their own players better than they were before. So I don't know if there's as many impact players in there. Uh, you know, USC's on probably two of the biggest ones, you know, Jordan Addison and then uh, Jermaine Lole, the defensive lineman from Arizona State but you know outside of that you're getting some guys like they just picked up a, a JC you know a Butler Community College offensive tackle that you know looks good but he's only been playing football a few years you're probably going to get more guys like that than like proven commodities like Jordan Addison. Ryan uh, obviously the three letters NIL have become all the rage and talking in college football these days how would you say that USC has adapted to this new landscape so far? Sort of like the West Coast and Pac-12. I mean, it's pretty slow, I think. Uh, you know, USC has some big boosters, but they're not organized. So it was funny when, like, the Jordan Addison stuff was coming out and there was, like, this $3 million deal. It, it, it didn't pass the smell test for me. I think USC will get there, but they are not. Uh, or, they're not organized like a Tennessee or a Texas A&M or anything like that where there's all the, you know, a organized activity going on. There's no collective at USC to this point. And even though, you know, Lincoln Riley's a good recruiter. They've lost a player already because of NIL. So Josh Connerly, the the five star defensive, I mean offensive tackle from Seattle, ends up going to Oregon, and you know they were able to put together a nice NIL package there. So I 
I think USC will get there, and there's some there's definitely some benefit to being in Los Angeles, but it's more for the star player kind of thing, like a Caleb Williams, than for like a backup guard where maybe in Lincoln, Nebraska, is going to get a lot of money. Mm. Um, so I, I think that's where USC needs to kind of focus on. They're sort of slow to adapt to this stuff, but you know they have a lot of you know there's a lot of advantages there, but having like a collective you know putting NIL to, uh, packages together just isn't one of them right now. Addison was at U- it was at UT in Austin. They put on a show, as you could imagine, wined and dined and whatever they could possibly do, and and they obviously are a logo and a blue blood. Uh, you, you even hear smoke that who knows Alabama might get involved at some point. Right now, where do you feel like that needle is headed? You know, it's just from the beginning when we like it's sort of like the Caleb Williams thing. It just like kind of made sense uh, to end up at USC. I think the same you know the same thing applies here. I would. I, Texas is definitely an attractive place, and I think you know his, it seems like his visit was good there. And uh, you know, obviously Alabama, you're talking about playing with the Heisman Trophy winning quarterback. I mean, there's, there's definitely some some soft landing spots for Addison, uh, but just for as far as like if you're going to go one year somewhere, you were at Pitt, had all the success, play with your you know friend from childhood and Caleb Williams, and and try to be part of something that you know, Lincoln Riley's been putting together and, you know, maybe get some big deals just because you're in Los Angeles and um, you're bringing some cachet because you are the, the reigning bullet in the cup work winner. That's sort of where I'm pointing right now, but you know, it's, it's crazy. Someone could come in with some huge money in NIL, and I think that's where USC would have an advantage. And then, you know, could he end up at Texas or Alabama? I think that's certainly possible. How can LA, how can USC not have an NIL advantage? Because as you mentioned, they're just not quite, they're not organized right now. Yeah, so like, so Caleb Williams, if he was in, uh, you know, where, like, if he's in Tallahassee, like, he's going to be the biggest name in that region, right? right okay. and, you know, here, I mean, there's LeBron James. There, I mean, there's every <laughs> place person, whatever you want. You name a million play, Like, he's not in the top twenty-five. He he talked about being able to walk around in Los Angeles, get dinner someplace, and like Kim Kardashian was there with Pete Davidson. You know, <laughs> no, everyone's paid, like the paparazzi are there, but not for him. And, and, <laughs> And I think that's one of the things. But he still was able to get, like, a big beach deal. Uh, as a star, you can make money in Los Angeles. But as, you know, it, college football is just not the biggest deep deal here. I think they will get together and have a collective and, and put some packages together. But right now, they're just not kind of there yet. USC sort of uses it inherent advantages in other ways, you know, like being in L.A. and stuff. Uh, there's some advantages to being there, but. The organization, as far as that stuff goes, uh, they're not quite there yet. They well, can't, they can't, can't host get, a Super Bowl. No one even sometimes yeah. knows it's they, there. They know? can't get Spielberg and yeah. uh, and like Will Ferrell and these guys together, Ryan, and and, and do one. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it would be great, like the Snoop Dogg or whatever coming out to like recruiting visits. Like, there's there's a lot of stuff that they could do. Um, and you know, when when people were coming visiting and they were be able to check out like Super Bowl activities, like stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's a unique thing you can do in Los Angeles. So they try to use that to their advantage, um, but you know, and they have a rich alumni. They just there's not like this. There wasn't this push to kind of get out in front of the curve and put an NIL collective together right. like there were in other places. Like you know, we you see like Tennessee doing some crazy things and and making a lot of progress in recruiting. I, I think USC will get there as as it becomes more mainstream, but they weren't going to be you know leading the the charge for something like that. So Ryan, it's been a few months since Lincoln Riley just you know shocked the college football world with his decision to leave Norman for L.A. Uh, what have been sort of your impressions uh, in hearing him talk, hearing him kind of get his bearings around Los Angeles? Uh, what's kind of been your thought process in terms of how he's started uh, his tenure so far? Yeah, I think it's gone, you know, really well. We weren't sure because at USC, like, one of the things is, like, you want to try to get, you know, you want to be, you know, make headlines in the papers and things like that practices are normally open. There's usually you can talk to any player, any coach all the time. And a lot of my colleagues are like, wow, you have it so good there. Um, Cause you know, if, if you don't, t- if you don't allow media to come in, they'll just talk about the Dodgers or the Lakers, or the Kings or whatever, you know, something else. There's a lot of other things. It's more of a pro town than a college town. He did allow, you know, some part of practices open. He did allow a lot of interviews, but they were a little more closed than what we've seen in the past. But I thought he was very forthcoming. Uh, we got to talk to a lot of assistants and, and players, things. So he sort of kind of had a little balance to where things were pretty shut down when he was at Oklahoma, and they've opened up a little bit at, at USC. And I think that's probably going to work where the, lo- the local media can still get a lot of content out of it, and he's kind of still keeping you know things close to the vest. But 
he, uh, I think he had a good impression on everyone around here. The fans, I think, really enjoyed, you know, the spring game. They had it on ESPN. And just being more nationally relevant is something that the fan base has been trying to do for a long time. And I think Lincoln Riley getting hired, he's been able to do that. And I think he's, you know, saying and so far doing the right things. He hasn't won a game yet, so you got to do that. But so far, I think he's on the right track. If, in fact, they start to win, and I'm not trying to suggest the days of when they had the great run with Leinert, Bush, and company, and people like that. But USC football is about front runner, right? I mean, the fans, the stars will start to show up if they win. Hundred percent. I mean, this is like the way LA is. Just it's more of a, you know, you got to win and you got to be entertaining. Um, you know, it, it's funny that the Lakers were pretty bad this year. People are still going. I went to a Laker game late in the season, but typically, if the team's not winning, no matter how popular they are, like people have other things that they can do. Uh, but they'll get behind the winners, and I think you know. When Pete Carroll made his run, the Rams weren't here, the Chargers weren't here, so they kind of became the de facto NFL team. Uh, you know, the Rams just won the Super Bowl, so you're competing with that um, just on the street too. But I feel like if they, if he's able to get off to a good start, and it's built up pretty well in the Pac-12. Pac-12 is not great right now. They sort of have the capability of being in Alabama in a conference that doesn't have a Georgia or an LSU or a Florida or anything like that. So it, it, to me, it was always like if you're if you're screwing up at USC, it's like you're trying. Like you almost have to try to mess it up, and that's what they've done really for the last decade uh, with the hires they've made and athletic directors and things like that. So it seemed to be set up pretty well for Lincoln Riley, and because of the portal and because of the transfer rules where you can get a guy and have him not sit out a year. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, if they go eight and four, I think it's a huge improvement over last year. But if they won ten games, I really wouldn't be shocked either. Uh, you know, knock it on the door to, to win the conference. So it's uh, it's one of those things where if they start winning like that, I think people will, you know, show up again. We've seen just our traffic and everything on our website went up about 30% just mm. by hiring Lincoln Riley. So people wanted someone like that was, they wanted USC to take football seriously. And by hiring Lincoln Riley, it looked like they were doing that. Man, it's still fascinating to think about <laughs> what all occurred back then with, with the whole move and everything like that. So it's definitely going to be a book one day. Uh, Ryan, like as you said, I mean, there's room for them to compete pretty quickly uh, with Lincoln Riley, and you may have referred to it earlier, but if they are only 8-4, and four, and I say only, but only 8-4, and four, maybe they're 7-5 and five for some reason, why would that be in your opinion? So I think on offense, they're going to be good again. I mean, they, they have the pieces at wide receiver, running back, they have a really, like, a bringing guys back. He's brought a lot of guys back on the offensive line. There's a lot of experience there. They brought in a couple of transfers. I think the question will be on the defensive side. I think Alex Grinch has done some good things, like when he was at Washington State and had some good years. But, you know, it's tough sometimes when you're playing a team that, you know, you're playing with a team that has scored a whole bunch of points. Uh, and that's what Lincoln Riley's offense are going to do. So I think the question is going to be on the defensive side, particularly the front seven. But they, they lost pretty much their entire secondary from last year, too. But they were woeful. I mean, they were just so bad. I think they were last in, you know, points per drive or something in the Pac-12 last year allowed. It was just it was just awful. And it, so if they lose some games, it'll probably be some, like, high-scoring kind of close ones. If they lose four or five games, it'll probably be because of the defensive side of the ball. Ryan, great stuff as always. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, guys. Thank you. Ryan Abraham, USCfootball.com. On with us on Southern Cal. That's approach. still so interesting that he made that move. I mean, it really is just such an. I mean, that that you know, we I don't think we really got to fully appreciate the chaos of that because, um, for one, Baylor suddenly found themselves in the middle of the Big Twelve title race, uh, so that took precedent. You know, as far as our what we were focusing in on, but man, that's just wild. So wild that that all just happened the way that it did, when it did, and and how it did, and then you know. Thankfully, Lincoln Riley, you know, like a month ago, finally clears that clears the air on it with his little Players Tribune article. But uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm so intrigued by you know the the hopes out there, and it's been a really long time since USC mattered. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's been a really long time. So this will be fascinating to to watch unfold. And you know, I mean, he's he's got some. Some big shoes. He's not exact, you know. He's not filling big shoes with Clay Helton, but just in terms of the expectations now. I mean, they are ginormous. Uh, you know, maybe not this year, but in you know, next couple of years, they're going to have to you know be back in the mix to make this all feel like it was worth it. But uh, I, I think Lincoln Riley will do well out there. He will either be unbelievably successful, or it will be like a thud. We we got yeah. a break from Mike Scarborough, who covers LSU. 
His thoughts about the Tigers and Brian Kelly next on Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Riverbend Liquor and Wine. Look, it's the weekend. Uh, if you're heading out to barbecue, I went to a barbecue last weekend and uh, stopped by there uh, to get uh, a bottle of whiskey for a, a friend of mine who was hosting the barbecue. Uh, just to say, you know, a thank you gift and, and welcome. You know, glad that we were back after three years of not having that uh, annual barbecue. But I went in there and got him some whiskey. And they're the best when it comes to high-end bourbons, uh, high-end whiskeys, locally sourced bourbons and whiskeys from texas tx whiskey balconies devil's river um, garrison brothers they've got them all there at riverman liquor and wine lakeshore drive north 19th street behind the bank also a drive through window that will just i mean it, it's like your hair's on fire going through there uh, you tell them what you want they hand it to you take your credit card you're uh, i would say less than five minutes almost every single time uh, from the time you pull up to the window and maybe even less than five minutes if you're waiting behind someone in line that's how quick and efficient they are that's where the customer services like at Riverman Liquor and Wine, Lakeshore Drive, North 19th Street, behind the bank. Check them out on Instagram. At Allen Samuels in Waco, we're committed to taking care of our customers, and that means having as much new inventory on hand for you to choose from. During the Memorial Day sales event, shop for a large selection of 2022 cars, trucks, and SUVs to find the vehicle that's right for you. Need maintenance or repair? Let our skilled technicians take care of your vehicle, and we'll get you back on the road safer than before. We're not here just to sell you one car. We're here for the long haul. Allen Samuels in Waco. Come by. Let's be friends. Camille Johnson Realtors guide you seamlessly through the process of buying your dream home or selling your current one. Commercial, farm and ranch, or residential, Camille Johnson Realtors can smoothly and successfully lead you through any transaction. With a team of 28 experienced agents who are excited about serving you, Camille Johnson Realtors services the entire greater Waco area. If you're in the market to buy or sell, contact Camille Johnson Realtors, 104 Midway Center in Woodway, or find them online at www.camillejohnson.com. Camille Johnson Realtors, elegant, charming, Warm. Welcome home. Don Humidor, your home with a 48-foot walk-in humidor with the elite cigar brands from around the world, including the number one cigar of the year, Aging Room, Quattro Nicaragua. Plus, they have the great brands like Macanudo and Artur Fuente, Rocky Patel, Aston, and so much more. CBD, great for sore muscles, aches and pains, sleep, Vita Dreams and anxiety, mild depression, general health and wellness. Their staff, very knowledgeable on the subject. If anyone is curious about CBD, ask Carol and Ashley. John Schumanor in the Talwood Shopping Center off Valley Mills in Waco. The secret to living your best life is pizza, obviously. Golden crust made from scratch, three fresh signature cheeses, and the toppings, crispy old world pepperoni, savory Italian sausage, bacon. That's called a dream team. Find everything you need to live your best life and more at Marco's Pizza. Owner Bob Mock has been delivering pizza since 2001 and is the proud owner of four locations in Waco, Bellmead, China Spring, Woodway, and soon to be open in Robinson. Marcos. Pizza lovers get it. Did you know that one out of every four men have symptomatic low levels of testosterone and don't even know it? And if you think you're too young to worry about it, guess again. Low T levels can make you feel tired and grumpy, cause weight gain, and wreak havoc on your sexual desire and performance. Petty Clinic Low T can set up same-day blood screening and results, so if you're tired of being tired, I challenge you to man up and Google search Low T Waco or go online PettyClinicLowT.com. It's a private clinic with an atmosphere catering to men. Affordable, only $150 a month, includes lab work, office consultation, testosterone injections, follow-up visits compared to $395 a month in Dallas or Austin, and you don't have to fight the traffic. Petty Clinic Low T is board-certified physician consultations, will provide the best form of brand-strength testosterone available. Contact Petty Clinic Low T today. Just off Highway 84 and Old Hewitt Drive in Woodway, Petty Clinic Low T, helping men become the high-performance men they deserve to be. PettyClinicLowT.com or Google search Low T Waco. Welcome back to Sikkim 365 Radio. Have you downloaded the Sikkim 365 Radio app? Do it today on the App Store and Google Play. Oh, man, he's one of our favorite. Maybe the favorite. Mike Scarborough, TigerBait.com, covers LSU. We love him to death. He joins us, Sikkim 365 Radio and 365 Sports. Did that? Did you get the video you needed of the, the prospect 
that you were uh, trying to film? As soon as I told you about that this afternoon, lightning uh, started hitting all around Baton Rouge, so I missed him. And he's actually a running back that Baylor has offered, Caleb Jackson, at uh, Liberty High School here. He's one of the high four-star kids for, for 23. But um, they'll reschedule it, and I'll get it. So um, right. he's a good one. All right. So let's look at now Notre Dame. I know that's spring – I mean, excuse me, LSU. Damn. Uh, spring's been gone for a while as far as uh, practices and stuff. They had to go find people because they lost a lot of people. Where do you really think, in the end, did they win more than they lost as far as the transfer portal? Uh, look, when you look at uh, you know the people who are out there in, in rating rec- recruiting classes based on the transfer portal, certainly LSU has done a fantastic job. Um, 15 so far, still got a couple of spots out there. What, what are they going to end up filling it with? Um, you know, the, the money's on a tight end. What that other position might be is up in the air. Um, but I, I think when you go line by line, and I think I think more than half of them are going to be hits. And I think that's going to be a pretty darn good track record if, if more than half of them are hits. And, um, you know, when you get Bernard Converse from Oklahoma State, a corner in a big knee position, Wingo, uh, Miles Frazier, um, you know, got a, a a starting punter coming in that'll be here uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, of course, he was with with Polian at Notre Dame, and so um, I think there's some pieces there. I know a lot of people are a little up in arms here the last few days, is and I'm sure y'all have talked about it some where they're, they're putting uh, the Vegas odds on on uh, one wins and losses, and we're seeing LSU at six and a half. I, I, I think LSU's in the seven and five, eight and four range. Um, I, but of course, we, you know, we we joked this week that by by August, LSU fans will be predicting nine and three. <laughs> Mike, uh, the quarterback battle. Uh, there's three guys in it. Nobody got in the portal uh, afterwards. Uh, what are we supposed to take from that? That yeah, was shocking. Um, I just, you know, whether it was Garrett Nussmeyer that I thought might be the guy, but Nussmeyer performed very well in the spring game. And, and I thought, you know, maybe he doesn't get in there because he, after the way he performed, maybe he thinks he can win the job. And sure enough, uh, all four quarterbacks, including the true freshman, Walker Howard, are all going to be there during the summer. So, um, on one hand, it, it's, that's a positive. Um, but then at some point, it can become a mess. And at what point does it become a mess? And so we're going to see if Miles Brennan, uh, who, who I believe is reinvigorated and is really bought in and seems to have a new love for the game uh, with, the, with the new coaching staff and, and new uh, uh, coaches, Dan Brock and Joe Sloan. Um, you know, does he make a push? Um, or is it going to be Nussmeyer, who's more athletic? And then you got Jay Daniels, who comes in from Arizona State, who I think of the four quarterbacks, he's probably your least accurate thrower. But he might be the guy who's the most dangerous when a play breaks down. So, and so that's you know towards the end of spring. That's why a lot of us in the media were asking Kelly after uh, you know the last few media opportunities we had. Um, is is there is there getting to a point now because nobody's separating themselves? They like a quarterback who can move. Uh, are they setting themselves up for a two quarterback system? And I know they don't want to go there, um, but I tend to think if it's Nussmeyer or Brennan that win the job there's still going to be some packages for Jaden Daniels somewhere. Mike, uh, what do you think will be the most noticeable differences in terms of what LSU does defensively now under Matt House? Um, that's a good question. Um, I will say I think the defensive front is going to be a huge strength for LSU. Um, and so where's the pressure going to come from? Is it going to come from the edge? You've got two very good edge rushers in Ojolari and Ali Gay. And, and up the middle, you've got Jaquel and Roy and Mason Smith, Jacoby and Guillory, and many others. Uh, that's probably w- one of the deepest units on the team, uh, in the most, in one of the most talented along with wide receiver. So, um, I think the linebackers going to be very good. I think the, the biggest question mark, even though you've got some bodies there, is going to be defensive back and the whole LSU DBU thing is going to get put to the test this year. So, but I think the DBs can be helped if you're getting some uh, pretty significant edge rush. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to see what, between Jamar Kane, 
the new defensive line coach in Coach House, um, how they game plan and, and, and what they do. And But it, it, I'll tell you this, you know, all the players, you know, no matter who the coach is, they're going to say all the right things. But I, I know some of these guys. I've been covering them since they were freshmen and sophomores in high school, a lot of them. And when they start talking about the, the coaches and the things that they're doing and their eyes get real big, um, I, I think there's a lot of renewed excitement. And, and I'll say this, too, about this LSU football team. Physically, what they've, what we see the way these guys look like physically in just three or four months under a new strength and conditioning coach is unbelievable. So um, I think there's a lot of reason to be excited. Of course, it's, it's, a, it's an odd year, so that means LSU goes to Auburn, to Texas A&M, to Gainesville. Then Tennessee roll, uh, rotates in. Um, I don't know if y'all are buying Tennessee, but a lot of people wondering if that's a game to worry about. And then Ole Miss will be dangerous. Alabama, of course, Mississippi State, Florida State uh, on Labor Day weekend on a Sunday. You know, is it a seven and five team, an eight and four team? I think it's going to be somewhere in there. Just uh, hearing that schedule, have fun, Texas and Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> have fun with that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Mike. Uh, how much? What do you see the biggest differences after now? You know, getting to know what Brian Kelly and staff are going to do compared to what they let go and in, in, in Coach O and 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 his. I mean, I guess you know, you win the national title as a native Louisiana, and uh, people can't understand that you kind of take the party, uh, you know, over a couple years. But what do you think is the biggest difference you see? Um, having covered the LSU football program since the Hallman years in Jerry DiNardo, um, and going out to practice every year, the attention to detail is, is right there, if not even more so than when Saban was here. That that's what is so obvious. If it, and I joke, but I'm also halfway serious. If you said it when we're in the uh, the main theater room after practice waiting for the coach to come out to talk to us about, you know, uh, spring practice that day. If you told me that the waste paper basket is in, in a different location because that's where Kelly put it and wanted it to be, I would believe you. And uh, just things like us having to wear lanyards and them printing out parking uh, passes. and, and it, But none of that had really changed. It was all where we had normally gone. But he has every, uh, every detail – is, is a part in his program. And it, it, even stuff like, I didn't know that this rule existed, that he bought a house within a mile of campus because in the rule book, if, if you live within a mile of campus, you can host recruits at your house. Oh, wow. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> Interesting. I didn't know that. I didn't know that rule until we, 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 uh, uh, we started digging around about where he bought his house. Hmm. And, that, and that was by design. Coaches I know previous – would be buying uh, out, uh, uh, far away from campus or, 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 or a good bit of different, uh, uh, ways away were in a gated community so they couldn't be bothered. This guy's wanting to ha- have uh, lawn parties with recruits. Very interesting. Very interesting. I had no clue about that rule. None. I, didn't, I, yeah. I did not either. Yeah. I, I didn't either. And it, it's, um, he, wanted to, he wanted to host them the Friday before the spring game, and, and something happened. He, he didn't have them. And I'm like, well, this is different. And uh, well, it, so why didn't it happen? Did he get the caterer in time? Uh, I don't. <laughs> furniture wasn't delivered. Uh, but uh, it's coming. It, 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 and it, he's got a big time spread. And I, I, I know the area pretty darn well. It's he looks. He comes out his back porch and looks out his uh, uh, stands in his backyard, and he can see the silhouette of, of Tiger Stadium in the distance. Oh, very cool. That's a, yeah. That that sounds like it will be a good little recruiting tool. And, and staying with recruiting, Mike. I mean, uh, let's. I guess you know NIL is the big to do, big topic nowadays. How do you think LSU has settled itself as far as NIL and dealing with that, and, and you know making it a positive overall? Um, look, they can say that they're set up and they've got it all the wrinkles ironed out, but uh, I don't think they'll they'll know. Uh, where they truly stand until December. Okay. Um, I know there's a lot of panic right now by some because LSU's sitting with four commitments. Usually, you know, in, in a, you know, several years into a, a, a regime, you, you, in May, LSU's probably somewhere around 9, 10, 11, and usually by August they're almost a 20. But what does that mean now? If, if, if the numbers were what they normally are and they're sitting at a dozen right now, or 20 in August and 22 in, 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 at the end of November, what does it mean when, when, when all the craziness, the first and second week of December starts happening 
with the NIL deals that's happening under the table. Yeah. I mean, so, so if you, you can get all the commitments in the world right now, but if some car dealer out of town decides that, uh, he, he really wants that player that's on, on your commitment list and he's going to offer a crazy amount of money, what are you going to do? Yeah, that's the question. It is, and, and, or what about NIL? And I know we got to go and you do too, but how about you get in the middle of the year and a guy gets a little bit frustrated because he hadn't done an NIL deal in a while and decides he may want to start looking about whether he plays or not? Well, uh, it, w- w- the, the coming weeks here, you know, we're starting to get some stuff come out now about what I- I'm starting to agree with. Uh, I don't know who it was the other day that said, you know, one of the biggest things you can do to solve a lot of this is, is to, to go ahead and pull back and rescind the uh, – the free transfer year. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, but so much of this stuff, it, it, it's it, the, the, the horses are out of the barn or whatever yep. cliche you want to use. You, you're not putting the, the, the toothpaste back in the tube. No, the genie's out of the bottle. That was Joe Moglia, but we had him on the show. In fact, yesterday, who's a part of uh, executive Gary Barta, who wanted to pull Gary, the, Gary Barta. Was wanted, that? Yeah. Oh, that's right. The out. Iowa AD. Most of what he said didn't make sense. It sounded like he was stuck in his head in the sand, but maybe that one's the one. No, that, it, it made yeah. sense. It's just that, like yeah. he's like Mike's saying, there's just no way that anybody's going to go for that yeah. at this point. You, you've already. I, 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 I just think at the end of the day, the schools that have been the most successful in recruiting and what they do, I think they're all going to be the same names. They're all going to be the same at the end. You know, here and there, you know, maybe you're going to have a little crazy A and M, and of course Jimbo will come out and and say uh, uh, NIL had nothing to do with it. Okay, Jimbo. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, it, it. but other than that, everything else, I, I think it, it's going to be true to form. I just think it's going to play out that way. All right, go get you some gumbo, jambalaya, boudin, whatever you're going to have tonight. Crawfish tails, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I'm going to have a queso burger tonight. Oh, well, queso burger. That's damn good, too. Yeah, go. Enjoy it. Thank you, buddy. Mike, we love you, man. Uh, Appreciate it. Uh, all right, guys. Y'all have a good weekend. Mike Scarborough, Tiger Bait. I, I love talking to him about pretty much anything. He's been there and covered him from back to front to front to back and everything else in between. Yeah, I mean, if we had a little bit more time, we could start getting into, you know, the reconstruction of the basketball roster and things like yeah. that. But, uh, you know, there's plenty of time to, to talk about those things eventually. But, yeah, I mean, Brian Kelly, I mean, that's interesting about the the home and the distance and what that allows you to do. I never knew that was a rule of some sort. So Could, could I, like, say I wanted to live outside of town and I'm a coach with, you know, making $10 million. Could I buy... A condo a, next to a, the campus, a, a house next to campus, and I'm sure that that might be like kind of a kid. Ask Brian Kelly. He seems to know those things. Stand. Yeah. All right. Uh, Baylor tennis tonight. Men's tennis hosting Stanford. Jack's going to be there for us because he does everything. Emery Winter, Jack McKenzie. We're back to wrap it up. Paul's top five next. Parenting is full of surprises. You never know what to expect. So after our son was born, I called my Texas Farm Bureau insurance agent to set up a life insurance policy in case something happened to me. Sawyer is now two. And we'll soon have a sister. There's no one else I would trust with protecting my family. Stop by and see our agents at one of our three McLennan County locations. Coverage and discounts are subject to qualifications and policy terms and may vary by situation. It's plain and simple. Waco Custom Marketplace is the one-stop shop for what you need for tailgating from charcoal, cold beer, and wine. And, of course, customize your order with brisket, tri-tips, sausage, wings, smoked pork tenderloin, country-style or pork spare ribs, marinated beef and chicken fajita meat, ground beef and chili, meat, hot dogs, and burgers, buns, seasoning, sauces, chips. There's fresh-baked bread and kolaches every day, breakfast sausage links, and you can also customize your favorite Favorite cut of steaks from select choice or prime, bacon wrap fillets, ribeyes, New York strips, sirloin, T-bone, and porterhouse. Full service butcher shop includes pork, poultry, beef, chicken, and seafood. Serving Waco restaurants and families since 1940. Your one-stop shop for beef, pork, poultry, and seafood needs. Waco Custom Marketplace, 425 Lake Air Drive, or WacoCustomMarketplace.com. From the first workout to the last practice, sports is an incredible challenge. Hi, this is Dan Ingham with the First National Bank of Central Texas, and we're proud to support each athlete, every parent, and our educators. From families, small businesses, to the biggest industry, we're here to help. With remarkable products like First Free Checking, we've got banking ideas that fuel big dreams. The First National Bank of Central Texas, familiar faces making local decisions. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. 
One size fits all. That may be all right for an adjustable belt or cheap sunglasses, but when it comes to your financial needs, no one wants a one size fits all strategy. Ben Erlinson, your Edward Jones financial advisor, knows that his most important goals are yours. That's why he takes the time to understand your needs, knowing you. That's how Edward Jones makes sense of investing. Ben Erlinson, 100 North 6th Street in Waco, 254 759 8533. Edward Jones, member SI. PC. Shorty's Pizza Shack at 12th and Bagby is a homegrown, family-owned and operated must-visit pizza place in Waco. Fantastic pizza by the slice or get the whole pie to share. Great happy hour specials every single day. And it's not just pizza. Great wings. You have to try the Sikkim sauce, chili cheese fries, pizza pillows, and more. Dine in for a great hangout or carryout. Order online at shortyspizzashack.com or do yourself a favor and bring your crew to the restaurant at 12th and Bagby. Shorty's Pizza Shack. Tell them Paul sent you by. Stepping into the boots of a U.S. Army officer can add confidence and leadership skills to your son or daughter's career path. See all the things they can achieve in our boots at GoArmy.com. U.S. Army Waco Recruiting Company, 254-598-8131 or 254-776-1543. This is Paul Catalina's Top 5 at 555. All right, we've talked a lot of college football today, and I knew we would, so I thought I would throw in an NFL, an NFL thing for the YouTube channel. Top 5 NFL free agency moves, and I nailed one of these today. I nailed it! So I'm very proud of myself. We'll get to that. It's number three. Number five, but these are things that uh, that I think would help teams I think are going to happen or would be best to happen for these remaining NFL free agents. Number five, Julio Jones to the Colts. They need help a wide receiver. Their quarterback is Matt Ryan, knows Julio very well. Didn't work out for Julio in Tennessee, so if he can stay healthy and play with his old quarterback, I would think this is a great move uh, or a good move for them, and we'll see. Again, it all is contingent on him staying healthy. Uh, he's probably going to have to change what he really does. Um you know, and, and the kind of player he was. But I think if anybody can do it, it's Julio Jones. But we'll see. I think this one uh, makes sense for the Colts in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, it makes sense. But, man, he has fallen off, hasn't he? Yeah. I mean, that I remember as a high – I'm sure a lot of people out there remember him as a high school recruit and just how – I remember Oklahoma was really, really in on him before he picked Bama. Um, yeah, phenomenal talent. But uh, definitely, no, not, not in uh, – his best days right now. But, yeah, I mean, the connection with Ryan makes sense. I don't know that I would really want him if I didn't have that connection, quite yeah. frankly. Like, I don't know how appealing he would be at this point. I mean, he still be, can be a good player. But, yeah, definitely the connection with Matt Ryan and, and their need for a wide receiver makes a, a lot of sense. And uh, do we know what's happening with T.Y. Hilton? Yeah, I don't know. I think still free agents. So okay. Maybe, yeah. so. Um, number four, Jadavian Clowney to the Seahawks. Now, he's been there once before. Uh, this is a, a team, the Seahawks, who have a division that has Kyler Murray, Matthew Stafford, um, and uh, and Trey Lance now uh, that they're going to have to play. But two of the better quarterbacks in the league and a an, uh, young and upcoming rookie. And they're going to have to probably win on, on defense quite a bit. I, I think even though he's, you know, in his one-year deal phase of his career, still an effective pass rusher, and they're going to need all the guys they can get. I don't think this will happen because of where Seattle is. But if they want to win anything this year, uh, because we don't know who their quarterback's going to be, and maybe it's going to be Baker Mayfield, but we'll see down the line. I think this is a good move for them because he's the best pass rusher on the market. For a guy that talented, he sure does move around a lot. Yep. Yeah. Because the talent you're thinking of is all based on when he was a recruit in high school. Yeah. I mean, in South Carolina days, and and really, has he ever lived up to the hit against Michigan? I no, mean, I don't think no. that he has. I mean, he he was probably unfairly, you know, kind of judged by just being the total freak show that he was. Uh, he's been solid. He's been fine. Uh, he's been good at times. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Seattle, I, I would just be – kind of freaked out right now that you don't have a quarterback yeah. like that would be my big concern but yeah Jadavian Clowney is still you know solid enough to make an impact so okay yeah Seahawks I don't yeah. see sacks under his uh schedule. yeah I think double digit sacks last year uh with the Browns hey, I'll take it number three the one I nailed Jarvis Landry to the Saints this happened today 
Uh, this is this is a good one when you've got Michael Thomas coming back, Chris Olave coming in, uh, another guy who can pick up first down three. Now, look, he's not what he used to be, but last year, you know, with the, the musical chairs at quarterback due to Baker Mayfield's injury, the fact that the offense was changing, this will be good. This is good for Jameis Winston. Uh, and, of course, I am an advocate of anything that makes Jameis Winston uh, be successful. So, hopefully, and this is weapons for him uh, in New Orleans. I, I like this move a lot. I think this is going to work out pretty well for both sides because I don't think they're I mean they're clearly not going to re rely on him to be the number one receiver he's going to be a guy who gets some first downs and scores in the red zone yeah I think uh, the Saints are trying to basically create LSU uh, yeah. with some of you know getting Tyron Matthew you now Jarvis Landry but yeah, I mean that's good news for Abram Smith as well he's got another new teammate to get excited about but yeah, I mean, that's a good pickup for the Saints. So the wide receiver pieces are kind of starting to finally settle in a little bit, but that was upended. You know, you think of T.Y. Hilton and Jarvis Landry and Julio Jones and all these guys, and you see what happened in the draft. It's pretty clear there's a youth movement going on right now. So, yeah, I mean, being back home in Louisiana at the bare minimum will create a bit of excitement. Number two, Anthony Barr, linebacker from the Vikings to the Cowboys. The Cowboys, uh, there was a lot of thought that they might draft him when he was draft eligible at seven, eight years ago. But this, to me, is hedges your bets against, it's kind of Anthony Barr and Leighton Van Der Esch kind of cancel each other out injury-wise. Was he not on the UCLA team that oh, yeah, Baylor yeah. pulverized? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think this. Of course, he's only one of eleven guys. But of course, they, the Cowboys aren't really going to do that. This would make sense to them uh, if they're going to do any of that. But again, uh, we know what they think of the free agency market and how it is. But this one is one that does actually kind of make sense based on the needs they have on the roster right now, especially the healthy people they have on the roster right now. Yeah, he'd make sense, but, you know, close to 10 years too late from when they actually wanted him, like you yeah. said. All right, I still remember the uproar over not getting him and how much he was predicted to be a Cowboy leading into that draft. But, yeah, better late than never, I suppose. And, and like you said, he makes sense from a depth and, and playing standpoint in terms of where some of their holes are right now. Yeah. Uh, and number one, this one's for Jack McKenzie, OBJ to the Packers. I just think at this point Jack in his career. Jack is so mentally exhausted, he can't just, even enjoy that. I think that at this point in his career, this is what he is. He's a hired gun, and I know he's coming off the ACL, and he won't be back for a little bit. But when he's healthy, I think this just makes sense. They don't – I mean, they've got to replace Devonta Adams somehow, at least a shell of that. How much does that suck? Excuse me. He is having a pretty good run with them, good pickup for them, and then tears his damn knee – and in the Super Bowl. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, not only that, Should've it sat ruins out. a free agency thing, <laughs> like a college player in a bowl game. And it's going to take six, eight, nine months. And so he's damaged goods. And, and who knows if he plays until November. <laughs> yeah. But I do think that, and maybe it doesn't happen until then, and maybe it shouldn't. Well, but I do think this one, I think this one's going to happen because it almost happened last year. Well, I think that he wants to be in L.A., um, but I don't know that they want to pay him the money. And yeah. so, yeah, that might not be an option for him, but I do think if he had his preference, he would be back with the Rams. But I can understand from their point of view why they wouldn't want to bring him back, you know, and for big money. So, yeah, I mean, Aaron Rodgers needs somebody. Dad, come. I mean, he needs somebody to throw to. So, yeah, that would that would make a lot of sense. All right, Paul, good stuff. Thank you very much. Emery Winter at one point had three separate headsets around his neck. We appreciate you and Jack McKenzie right now wishes he had probably something around his neck. He is, hey man, seriously, a new era started, right? And it's been great the last couple of days with the new stuff. We appreciate the constant graphics and Craig Smoke, Paul Catalina. I'm David Smoke. Thank to you, all of you, chat room and also the text line and the sponsors. Good night. Have a great weekend. Sikkim 365 Radio, 365 Sports. Ideal MRI is a small family business right here in Central Texas. We're open to support you while lowering the cost of health care bills. When you need an MRI, ask your doctor for an Ideal MRI. Visit us at IdealMRI.com or call us at 833-IDEAL-MRI. 